Oh, you know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? Let me tell you. Welcome to Texas. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Tex Ags Radio. Billy Lucci here on Tex Ags Radio. Olin Buchanan. We will develop men, we will graduate players, and we will win championships on the field. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I think we're coming into this year with a new confidence. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like... That's about as pretty a throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had no other option but one hand at that yeah, point. Yeah, man, 50 50 ball, I gotta come down with it. You know, if I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. Jack Moss, what a great statement to say this week. And welcome into Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Go Hour, presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations. It was a great weekend. Uh, women's tennis, men's tennis, softball, basketball. Uh, we had baseball coming back yesterday. My kids walked away for, I don't know, 10 minutes. Like, Dad, we're losing? Yeah, we're losing. And it was getting a little dicey, OB, but they found a way. I... Um was keeping up with the game, yeah. the baseball game on the thread. And I think it was 6-0 when somebody on the thread said, all right, when was the last time we won a series and shut out everybody? And everybody on the thread was getting mad at the guy. And about that time, uh, my wife dragged me to a movie that I was not interested in. It was like three hours long. And I sat in it, and I actually napped through the movie. Cause, what movie? Uh, Dune. Uh, Dune, I, I can see you hating that. Oh, yeah. it was, uh, so anyway. Did she like it? Yeah, because she's into that. Well, I think she thought it was disappointing. Did she see part one? Yeah, uh -huh. and I haven't. Okay. But anyway, cause that, that, that's that, the yeah. point is, I started getting all these text messages. I have a, a, a friend named Gerald that's a real huge Tex Agger and Aggie fan. Yep. And I started getting all these text messages. Of course, I can't look at it because I'm at the movie. You right. know, you don't want to get out. And I saw all this, what's going on? Da, 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 and then, hey, shot this. And I'm like, what What, what happened? And yeah. so I go back and check. So, oh, my gosh, it was 6-0. And I'm thinking, okay, another stroll in the park. And next thing you know, it turns out that had the Olsen magic had to come through. Yeah. Um, I don't it, – it was Olsen magic. I even tweeted it. But – that, that's not my favorite kind of Olsen magic. No. <laughs> you know, like when you're, when you're supposed to step on the throat yeah. and, and it seemed like they were going to. But you know what? I do think there is something about having to deal with adversity, regardless of who the opponent is, mm -hmm. that makes it... When you just steamroll everybody, it feels good as a fan. Like, mm -hmm. I, I enjoy it, right? Mm -hmm. But is there any growth in that? Is there any learning in that? There was learning yesterday. I'd rather not learn. I'd rather just steamroll everybody, but I know I get your point. Yeah, yeah, and uh, kind of like LSU did a couple years back, like football. Yeah, that yeah, kind of. Yeah, I would, I you would prefer rather, that? I'd rather my team just do that all the way to the championship. Right. LSU in 2019, what was it? Nebraska in like '95, uh, but um, you came out with a win, got into some very uh, difficult situations, yep. and found a way to get out of it. You did. So, yes, your point is well taken. Well, look, I'll take it however we get it. The interesting part was, like, they had the bases loaded. You, you weren't watching at the time, but they had the bases loaded in the eighth inning. I think it was the eighth. And, like, all right, this is our chance. It didn't happen. It took a walk, you know, like, uh, to, to tie the game and force extra innings. But I'll take it. Get it any way you can get it. What are they now, like 17-0 and 0 or 16-0? and 0? They're 16-0. and 0. And they'll be 17 and 0 when they open conference play next week against the Gators. Yeah, it um, it was fun. Or next or this weekend, next weekend. It, it was fun. Let's um, uh, can we go through the three things that I wanted to see this weekend? Yeah, and let's see how close we were. Do you remember your three? things? I never remember. I need to start writing them down. All right, but I know they're all typically. Tell me if I'm if I, if I was if I was close because I, I don't think I was as close as years past or weeks past. Manny Obaski with 13 plus. You got a that. controlled Manny, but an attacking Manny. You got that. You got I, well, that. I got that way more than just 13, yeah, though, right? Yeah, you got 25. It's a career high. You know, Manny has scored more points in the last four games than he did in, like, the previous like career. 15. <laughs> well, he had 21 against 
against Memphis. Right. So if you include every game before the last four games, including Memphis, I mean, starting at Memphis, he's had more points the last four games, 65, than he did in like the previous 15 or 16. So Manny with 13 plus, he gave us more than that. Here's you know what? what I, you know what? What? Momentum starts with Mo. It does start with Mo. That's right. Wade and Boots comp- combined for 30 plus. Did I get that? Yes, OB? you got that. You're right on the nose there. I I, I got that. What is it? They both had 19. Uh, yes, they both had 19. So they had 38. All right, we'll take that all day. <laughs> Give me that every game, and they're gonna they're gonna win. They're gonna win. They're gonna win. And then a Ryan Prager special. Can I get 10 strikeouts? I got more than that. What I get 13. Under prob- Yes, I under promise, and they over deliver for us this weekend. Gosh, yeah, you were. I was pretty good. You were all, all over. I was a little off, but you know, I I wanted to be you know like conservative, but still optimistic of their performance. And, and let's spread the love. You know, the the softball team went out, and <laughs> swept South Carolina. Had to win some pitching gems, a walk off. Yeah. They did it all this weekend. Yeah, it's a good weekend to be. It was. It's a, always a good week. Every week is a good week to be an Aggie. But that was a especially good weekend for Aggie sports. Yeah, it certainly. I, this. Uh, and a basketball game, by the way. So we were at the Angry Elephant. Good time in Magnolia. Really good time. Uh, we got to watch the game there. Nick was there. Nick's family was there. Billy was there. Steve McKinney came by. Steve's son came by. A lot of great uh, listeners. Or It was just a really good conversation. But we got to watch the game. And it's one of those games, like, they started off in a bang. What was it, 13-0 to start? 14-0. 14-0. 25 to, what was it, 25 they were up 25 something 25 yeah. 10 25 7 whatever it was okay right. it was it was a, and i believe it was nick savage who's who's not behind the glass today he's doing other things here he's doing management work but I, he goes oh here that comes the run and there came the run they got within 6 they got there this. and then a&m had a nice finish to the half mm-hmm. and they just kept on doing and what they, they do kept, and then they started the second half strong and never let up and it was a complete and thorough uh demolition of Ole Miss it was it was um I still think their win over Tennessee is their best win of the year yep but it was their most lopsided I think I mean considering yes you have more lopsided victories against teams to do that on the road to to do it on the road against an SEC team that had beaten you earlier yep Um, and a game where you were in control Kind of somewhat From control. Yeah. Yeah. You never really lost control. No, no, I'm saying the first time you played Ole Miss. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you, you had their foot on their throat. Yeah. Well, and you, you had a 7 0 lead with three minutes to go and didn't score. This time, the Aggies actually uh, allowed a 7 0 run at the end of the game. Right. But it, they were so far ahead. It was, I think it was just because they lost interest. Right. I don't, I personally dislike playing the same team you just destroyed in the first round of a tournament. Um, I just, it is very hard to beat a team back to back, especially with, but if they play like that, if, you know, it, one of the things that I, I, I remember telling Nick during the game that I was worried about is like, this isn't a sustainable model, what they were doing. It was sustained by the way, obviously, but like Manny coming out, just shooting random threes and Wade in transition hitting there. I was like, I don't feel like you can win like this. But they won like that. 13 of 26 from the three-point line. I I'm mean, okay they, with shooting 26 if they're going to hit 13. What, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, Wade was on. Boots was on. Obaski's. And Obaski is just – his emergence yep. has just opened so much up. And if he can continue that – of course, I'm not saying he's going to score 25 points every day, game, but if he can continue to be a – a consistent third op scoring option right now. He's the first option, yep. but a um, And M becomes very dangerous. Somebody tweeted at me because uh, Luke did a really wonderful job every time Luke Evangelist, by the way. Anytime Lenardi had a you know bubble watch, you know Luke would point out the good things A and M has done this year and why they should be considered higher. And I had a tweet about it myself and somebody came at me, he goes, it was a Longhorn fan, of course. He goes, aren't you sick of always having to defend your team? Um, and the the point is, yeah, I wish they weren't in this position, but that's what we do, right? Like when it's between <laughs> one or two, three, four, six teams, you start comparing resumes and yeah, the quad three losses hurt. Absolutely. The five game losing streak hurts. So this is a from a a fan of a team that once had someone fly 
a, the score of the Texas Oklahoma game over an Oklahoma Oklahoma State game the yep. stadium. Yeah, yep, yep. it's talking about having to defend your team. Yeah, yeah, yep. all right. Pal, hey, hey, Mister Mister Pot, this is Mister Kettle. You're black. Bottom line, though, is OB like when you when you look at this team, look, yeah, they still have work to do. Oh, without a doubt. My my whole thing is if if it continues going this way, and to me, they need at least one more, probably two more, but I think one more because they moved up. Two to, more gets them in because the second one be over Kentucky. Yeah. Um, one more might, but. It's going to be kind of need LSU to beat Mississippi well, State. Well, you know what hurt them um, is that uh, I mean it may not be the difference, but it but it was a it was a blow to them was that Florida lost to Vanderbilt, right? And all of a sudden that's not a quad one victory anymore. But so, so you weird, need everything yeah. you got. So how about uh, Vandy <laughs> winning some <laughs> games that you can't expect? Yeah. Uh, well, you know what? It's SEC play, and it, you wouldn't be playing in the SEC if you weren't good, right? And if you're not on your game every every time, um, you put yourself in jeopardy, and that's what happened with uh, with Florida. But um, look, the bottom line is we've learned it. Uh, if we haven't learned it, we sh- then we just can't learn it uh, over the last two years. That you can't count on a committee to do A and M any favors, right? You know, again, and you wonder just how much the SEC tournament really matters. Yeah. Because they made the final two years ago, didn't get into the tournament, made the final last year, and was still a number seven seed. Is it already written in stone that, hey, if they don't get to the – if they don't win the SEC championship, they don't get in at all? I mean, it's a – it may not be the case, but it is something to have to consider that – which I think is wrong because of all the – you know, why are you keeping up with the quadrant yeah. one wins and all this? And you're going to say that if the – let's say they beat Ole Miss uh, on a Thursday, that everything you did over a three-and-a-half-month period, really only – the only thing that matters is two-and-a-half weeks. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I want to read this. I wrote this down yesterday, and I double-checked it. I think Dawson triple-checked it. But every time I feel like A&M baseball is playing a game, just a quick quick note about baseball, <laughs> I feel like they score in the first inning. So I went back to the box scores to look at it. They have scored in the first inning 12 of the 16 games they have played this year. I feel like that is a great stat, A. Obviously, there's no feeling. It is a great stat. But what it does for your starting pitching to play with a lead, you know, that, to me, that is just phenomenal. To get into the second inning and know, hey, I'm leading. Yeah. yeah. Never anything bad about a fast start. Nope. And they've had it. They've had a, a, a fast start. And yesterday, a good, a good finish. I remember that 2012 football team that we all celebrated so much and continue to do so. It seems like they scored on their first possession like every game. Yeah. Maybe not every game, but it seemed like it. So, you all, like I said, you're always playing with a league. Hey, let's check in with the people. If you want to be part of the conversation, all you got to do is call us or text us 979-693-1150. You can call that number or you can text that number. I'd like to hear from you about the weekend. How was it from an Aggie fan perspective? Let's go behind the glass and say hi to uh, Cade Bickham. Cade, good morning, buddy. Good morning, you guys. What's How up with doing? you? Uh, I'm doing good. Well, I just wanted to give a quick little shout out, uh, continue your shout out to Aggie softball. Um, they uh, only gave up two runs all weekend. Um, and uh, Trinity Cannon, a little walk-off bomb on Saturday night. Adrian Beltre-esque, she kind of just threw her bat at it, ended up on uh, one knee. Um, it was excellent stuff. Uh, great hit. Did I see Nick pitching behind you? Because it's hard at the yeah. angle. Yeah, you And did. hitting? You did, yeah. Yeah, that was very well done, Nick Savage. I hope the people on the excellent uh, CW. Technique. Excellent technique. And YouTube saw that. You might say she was canonized. And there's the look. You you got to do a deadpan to the camera. <laughs> we should have a like a little little music that plays after you do that, like a little curb your enthusiasm or a oh. dun 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 <laughs> or a rim shot. There you go, a rim shot. No softball. We we we're working on some guests this week because uh, what a start, man! Outstanding. It's outstanding. What are they like? Seventeen and two, or something like They're, that. They're and and they find different ways to beat you. They'll walk it off. Twenty three and two. Twenty three and two. See, I'm, I'm you're six I'm, games off, buddy. Man, I'm where about seven games off? Yeah, I've been covering basketball. Yeah, you have. 
Hey, by the way, this is Coffee Talk presented by Texax Coffee. Beat the hell out of mornings by going to texax.com slash coffee. With that, we go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. We find Matthew Dawson there this morning. Matthew, good morning, buddy. Good morning. To add to that as well, Trinity Cannon, this is not just her second walk-off of the year. This is her second walk-off home run of the year. If you remember earlier in the year, I believe February 25th, UTSA, when she walked off the Grand Slam in the eighth inning there. I mean, she does it all. She absolutely does it all. I'm predicting she'll do it a, a, at least one more time this year because, you know, she is Trinity. She might as well. Might as well predict it. That's not a terrible, terrible prediction at all. So She's here. She's there. She's, she's here, everywhere. She's, there, she's everywhere. Boy, can't. Boy, can't. All right, anyways. What in the world was that? that? Was. Hold on. What, Expl- okay. what was that? Have you ever seen Ted Lasso? Yeah, of course. I've never He's seen here. it. He's there. He's there. He's there. Oh, now I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. All yeah. right. I'm, I hope the people that listen to this watch uh, Obi's a big movie. Ted Lasso. I've never I know. seen it. I've never seen it. I'd like to see it, but I don't have that, I don't have that TV. Yeah. Um, whatever it is. Whatever shows I up, bet you one of the kids on that works in here Apple probably has got like a, a, a link you could use. The FBI will be at your house tomorrow, but you could at least watch it. I'm surprised the FBI hasn't been at my house well, already. They're waiting. They're waiting for you to do more. Yeah. <laughs> it was a good weekend for other Aggie sports as well. We're talking about men's tennis. They went 5-2 yeah. and two against Ole Miss on Saturday, and then they had doubleheaders, so they played Lamar 7-0. So a nice little sweep there from them. And then Aggie women's tennis defeated Ole Miss 6-1. to one. I like beating Ole Miss. Yeah. Something about it, man. Is, is it the whole Lane Kiffin factor? or Maybe. 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 Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, we haven't done it in football recently. Yeah, I know. And it ain't going to be this year. Nope. Unless, Unless it's in a championship. They, I'll take that. Yeah. I mean, if they, all, if they gave me that option right now, would you like to play Ole Miss in the SEC championship game? I'd be like, I, sure. Sure, I'd play anybody. Oh, playoffs? Anybody, anywhere, anytime. Doesn't matter. Does not matter. Anything else, my friend? Oh, yeah. A&M track and field. They had the national championships that they were competing Oh, at. Coach Henry and the crew. Coach Henry and the crew. They finished, the men's team finished sixth um, in that slate, and the women's team finished 14th. Ahmad Robinson for the men ran the 400 meter in 44.91, which is incredible. If you didn't know, like only two runners at the entire event ran it under sub 45. So he earned his first team All American honors. And then for the women's team at Lamar Distance, she jumped uh, six foot five and a half or 1.97 meters to play second in the event and earn her first team All American honors. And from what I read, that is the sixth time that she's done that, which is unbelievable. <laughs> so. Uh, Lamar and Ahmad were two of the 10 Aggies that earned All-American honors that weekend. And no breaks, though. All gas, no breaks. Because, guess what? They begin the outdoor season by heading abroad for Puerto Rico. At the Puerto Rico Spring Break Classic, March 15th and 16th. So, they're getting after it. Man, that's tough. You have to, yeah. have to keep competing and go to Puerto Rico. And You know, I thought Coach Henry was my dog, right? Like, the yeah. AWG. Yeah, I, thought, I, like, I thought he would have just been like, Nuno, you should come. We should do the interview from here. I mean, no, just for, for business you, purposes. You, know, you know, you could communicate real well down there. Well, I can, I can, I can help him with the Ubers. Okay. Oye, yeah. señor, podemos ir ahí? Yes, yeah, and he'd be like, yeah, what he said. Hmm. I'm surprised he didn't. When we come back here on Texas, You could be the Broniger of uh, A&M track and field. You know, I am the Broniger when it comes to A&M soccer. soccer. Yeah. yeah. We'll see if they ask me back. I'm no broadager. I'll tell you that right now. All right. Is that a bad thing? Yeah. Well, what are we talking about here? <laughs> His gift of gab when it comes to baseball, I he's, don't have in soccer. He's, he's very good. I don't know. I haven't heard you on soccer, but I'm sure it's, you're exceptional. It's just, it's exactly what you'd think. That guy ran fast. Look what? at the, oh, excuse well, that me. That lady ran guy, fast. I was say, what else can you say? Ran Power. fast, kicked the ball hard. Okay, see, this is where you and I differ. By the way, can I give this guy some props for a moment? I forget. What, was it yesterday morning you were at the gym? Oh, were you there yesterday morning? Yes. Yeah. I saw this I dude on the was the, this, the, the old lady machine. What's it called? The elliptical? the elliptical. Yeah, the old lady machine. And I see a lot of guys on that. But yeah, go I'm ahead. kidding. I've done it too. You were on it. It looked like for an hour. I was. And you, there was no breaks. There was no like going slow. It was like you were sweating. You had your towel. You were you were going to town yeah. on that thing. So. Yeah. The endurance that you have displayed to me, I'm very impressed with, OB. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good enough try. that I think you should do the gladiator dash with You've got to keep the heart us. in shape. You know, gotta, i got to live long enough to be a grandfather. Yes, yes. Well, hopefully it's not soon. No, hopefully not soon. <laughs> not no. soon, right? That's, yeah. uh, but, but it's spring break this well. weekend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, My son's packed on, in, a, in a car on the way to uh, Desin as we speak. You think he's listening? No. 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 <laughs> no. 
no chance at all. All right. Uh, by the way, you should do the gladiator dash. I think you're in shape for it. Uh, the dash part is what scares me. You I just did an hour, like the, it's elliptical of the old lady dance. You it's know, the Elaine on the on a machine. You know, it's different when you're actually running. Yeah, you're actually sprinting. Different. Let's talk to uh, Chance McLean and Heritage Films. The website is yourheritagefilm.com. They make documentary films about people, families, uh, family ranches, family businesses, you name it, and they are certainly ready to do one for you. If you haven't thought about it, I know you've probably heard this spot for a while, but like you should really consider doing one for a big family event. Easter's coming up, uh, potentially 4th of July, birthdays, Father's Day, Mother's Day, you name it. Chance is the best when it comes to telling family stories. And the reason I, I suggest holidays is where everybody's together, right? You know, you got your kids there, your grandkids. Tell that family story, have them a part of it, get the B-roll, which is like the video that's, you know, spliced over the interview. He'll interview you, your family, and, and, and get the story done the right way. Two-hour documentary style, Chance does it. The best for normal, everyday people. That's why Chance is so good at what he does out there. He also does the Year Flicks, which is a shorter option, 20-minute video, Q&A reserved for the youngers out there. Let's say it's their freshman year of college. You want to find out what you know how college has gone. And then sophomore year, you know, hey, now they've picked their major, they're doing this. Junior year, they get their Aggie ring. Senior year, they find the love of their life. Make it a four-part story. Chance can do that with the uh, Year Flicks. The phone number is 713-893-8341. 713 713- Eight nine three eight three four one, or check out yourheritagefilm.com, yourheritagefilm.com.
Tex Ags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. The Go Hour presented by the Warehouse at CC Creations. The Evil Genius, Olin Buchanan, with me here. Just uh, evil. You're just no genius, just evil. But you're you're a genius at being evil. Okay, I'll take that. That was a joke from uh, the break. You can't hear what we were talking about. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, I already said we're Tex Ags Radio, right? Yeah, I said that. Yeah. And you're you're OB. I said that, right? Uh, yeah. And I'm David Junior. I, I didn't say that. I don't think. Yeah, you said it to begin the show. Okay, and today is uh, Monday, March 11th. Did I March say that? March 11th. 2024. No. You didn't say that. No. March 11th. Already. I don't think people would know what day it is. Ten days till spring. Spring break. Spring break is already. Hopefully six days away from finding out that A&M is in the NCAA, NCAA tournament. tournament. March Madness. It's so much fun when your team is involved. Yeah, like, interestingly, the, the wave of emotions... I think three weeks ago, I can't get the time right. Three weeks ago, I was like, let's buy our tickets now to all the big cities. And then it's like, we ain't going anywhere. And now I'm like, we might go we somewhere. We might get in there. We might. might. In. We still got work to do. Yeah. Let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center because uh, Matthew Dawson is going to present the latest Joe Lenardi bracketology and just kind of give us uh, where the Aggies are trending. Yeah, well, I, I guess he hasn't updated it. Today, I'm as of yesterday, good. though, right? But as of yesterday, AM is still in the first four out. Uh, it was tough that Drake beat Indiana State because they were on the outside looking in. Yep. And Indiana State's a top 30 net team, and that they kind of let that game slip away. So that that's if you count, that's one bid that's already Gone. been stolen from Texas A&M. And uh, we we need some other teams to kind of come in, come in, come in big for us. So we're still sitting in that first four out on the outside looking in. So a couple things about that. First off. Lenardi does not represent the committee. Right. It's just an opinion, right? He had A&M, I think, fourth uh, as a four seed last year, number mm. seven seed. Right. So, so it's, it's just an opinion, and who knows what they're thinking. That's A. B, I keep talking about Mississippi State versus A&M if A&M gets S, uh, seven SEC teams. I recognize, and I, and I think most of you do, there's no guarantee the SEC is going to get seven teams, right? I'm just going based on if the SEC were to get seven teams, to me— I don't understand Mississippi State over A&M. I recognize that they did bad in the quad three games. I, I do. Mm-hmm. I also think they've done pretty well in the quad one games. Yeah, well, Mississippi is, I'm sorry, Mississippi State is four and eight in quad one games and two and three in quad two games. So in the better games, they are uh, then, that would be six and 11. By con- uh, contrast, A&M is 11 and nine. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's supposed to mean something. Sure. And you finish higher than them in the standings, and you beat them. You beat them. Head to head. Right. But you put yourself in this position because from that two and a half weeks, losing a game to South Carolina that would have put you in without a doubt, and losing at the buzzer to Vanderbilt, and earlier you lost at the buzzer to Arkansas. So you put yourself yeah. in this position. If you don't make it, it's your fault. Yeah. Right, I don't think we have as much room to whine no. as we did a couple years ago. Two years ago, you had a real legitimate reason to be pissed off. Well, that's based on today. If they go all the way to the finals again in the SEC tournament like they've done the last two well, years. Well, then they'll get in, I would believe, because even though previous committees have obviously just dismissed the tournament, you will have gotten a quad one win over Kentucky and then probably a quad, win win, quad one win over you know Alabama or South Carolina. Here's one. Um, Joe, Joe Still on Twitter told me, no reason to compare ourselves to another team on the bubble. Our problem is not playing up to expectations all year. Sure. But this is a talk show, and this is a Twitter. No, I tweeted about it. Like That's what we do is we analyze, we break it down, we compare our, our resumes to those that are outside looking in as well and try to make a case. Um, yeah, I mean. If A&M the- at their best is better than every team on the bubble that I've seen. Yeah, at their best. The problem is that they're not at their best a lot. <laughs> uh, but now that man, the the emergence of Manny makes A and M a very dangerous team again. Yeah, uh, and the return of Henry, by the and way, the return of Henry. Yeah. So it looks like they're going to be playing. I'd even say their best basketball uh, because now you have this third option. I'll say this though. I mean, Manny's playing great, and I hate to call anybody out, but you got to be at your best and. Jace Carter's got to learn to finish some layups. Yeah. I mean, I, you've got to be at your best, and part of that is get you're getting to you got a guy that's supposed to be, you know, one of your better contributors, 
and he really struggles to finish layups. I, I don't know if they have a stat that shows exactly how many times you miss a layup, but I bet he's I, he's he's struggling. So he's got to get that iron out. Anderson Garcia, just keep doing what you do. Solomon Washington, just keep, keep doing, doing what, what you're you doing. Do. Hopefully, Mo keeps mowing. The M O stays with Mo leading the way, and you know uh, Wade Taylor starting to play well again. Well, this is a kind of a different situation, but. We were critical, I was critical of a couple of things that were happening this season, uh, but I also have to give props. In three straight years, Buzz has tinkered enough with the offense. It's not, it's not been the same thing every part of the season, right? He has tinkered with the offense, and now the newest wrinkle is the Manny Obasaki Manny. into the starting lineup right. and giving him the ball a little bit more. Yeah. And um, it's not the same as Quentin Jackson. It's not. I'm not I'm, I'm, but I'm comparing the mindset of right. let's give this athlete a chance to be an athlete. And he's making plays. And I don't know if he can continue to shoot threes the way he did, but I there's a couple threes. I was like, don't shoot that. No. Oh no. Oh yes. Shoot that. In fact, th- that happened once with Wade. I was standing next to Billy. We were talking to a gentleman and Wade hits this three. I'm like, don't shoot that dude. Oh my gosh. What a beautiful shot. It was like one of those reactions in the last three games. Cause he didn't shoot any, threes in the uh in the game against Georgia. But in the last three games, Manny Obasaki has made seven of five where are you? Seven of ten three pointers. Here here's something to consider. Ole Miss can hit threes. They didn't hit they didn't hit a I think they hit what, twenty eight percent in that game? Twenty eight point six percent. They hit eight or nine of them eight or something? Twenty eight. Good. I just happen to got the stats up here. So, so. I like well, – you're the stat man. Prepared. Let's hit a break here. When we come back, can we get into some football? <laughs> There's never a bad time to Can talk we football. get into some fighting? Oh, you want to talk women's basketball now. We could talk women's basketball. <laughs> we could talk Francis Ngannou getting knocked the out. Who's that? Yeah, exactly. Anthony Joshua, familiar with his game? No. Okay. We can talk uh, UFC 299, or we can talk women's basketball. I'll let you pick when we come back. Right. Those are your options of fighting. So UFC and women's basketball. And boxing. One and the same. <laughs> and boxing. Yeah, and boxing. And with a UFC fighter in boxing. All right. All right. That and more next here on Tex Ags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
All right, we're back here on TechStacks Radio. We're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. I want to talk fighting here for a moment, but can you read that uh, text message you got from your son? Yeah. And, and read it the way it... it okay, so yeah. I'm, I'm asleep by 1230 Saturday night because okay. I'm old. And uh, he must have been excited and probably had a Quinn. drink or two, Quinn. Yep. And so I wake up Sunday morning to this text message, and it says, Welcome to the Sugar, sugar Show. Not sugar, but Sugar Show. Dustin Pottier and Sugar <laughs> Sean O'Malley, ML Easy Money Baby. So I'm like, what the hell is that? So Sean O'Malley uh, won his fight this weekend. Yes, um, it was against Tito Vera. It was a great win. Okay. And um, Sugar is Sugar. Okay. Sean O'Malley. Sugar. Yeah. Okay. And, and and Dustin Poirier. Okay, Poirier. Yeah, he destroyed uh, Benoit. Like destroyed him. Well, anyway, my son apparently made a bet and won. Yeah. I hope you read and more I didn't of these know what he's, I didn't know if those guys were basketball players or what. I know this will um, – I think it will do great with the audience, but I think people should text in more things like that for you to read. <laughs> that could be a great segment. <laughs> OB Reed Slang. <laughs> <laughs> OB Reed Slang. So did you watch the women's basketball game between South Carolina or LSU, no. or did you see tweets that I, kind of yeah, hurt I was, your interest? I, again, I was stuck in this marathon of a movie. Right, uh, but then I got out. And I started seeing all these things to happen, and then I'll say this: uh, people have been clamoring, or the media seems like they've been clamoring to for for there to be more interest. viewership and interest yeah. in women's basketball. And if they can get, and I, by the way, women's basketball, it seems to me just infinitely more infinite more fights than in men's basketball. I mean, th there's been tons of them this year. Uh, and uh, there's another one. So, hey, if I can count on a good cat fight, I'm going to watch it. <laughs> All right, Seinfeld. Um, <laughs> so a couple things. I did not watch it happen real time. I watched it on Twitter like many people, right? And I did not have a problem with um, – what's the young lady's name who did the, the second push? Matthew, do you remember her name? I do not. I'm I sorry. She's the Brazilian girl from uh, who hit the game-winning three for South Carolina on Saturday. Okay. I think she was Brazilian. Maybe she's Portuguese. Camila Cardozo? Cardozo. Cardozo. I didn't have a problem with that push. Okay. She, somebody kind of pushes your teammate, you get their back. I know Kim Mulkey had a problem with it because she's so big, but I didn't have a problem with it. I did have a problem with, is it Flo Johnson's brother jumping on the court? What, so a guy got involved in it. Oh, yeah. Her oh. brother jumps over the scorer's table. And, like, and like a, it looks like he, I don't know if we have that video. We may not have it. But it looks like he's, like, about to, like, Touch, what was it, Cardoza? Cardoza. And he's like, wait, she's 10 inches taller than me. Wait, this wait, ain't going to go well. And now, he kind of backs up. But he jumped onto the court. He probably just figured out, oh, wait. He probably had a moment of clarity. I don't need to be doing this. I'm going to get arrested. Well, I think Kim is like, what are you doing, yeah. Mulkey, your friend? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Christian like, and Cruz are in a, in, a, in a game for Consol. Somebody pushes Cruz, and like it's, it's a hard push. I jump over the – I would go to jail. I think when it's in a in a in a in a game environment, you gotta stay under control and let let it be handled. Yeah, handle the field. If you're walking down the street and somebody attacks your wife, they die. I don't care if it's a woman. You know, I'm gonna take. They up die. Her, right? right. I don't there. know if they die, but no, I, they die. But I but I intervene. Yeah. Right. In that situation, now from what I understand, the girl that got pushed by the six eight girl. Yeah. Is small. Is yeah, what, but she also had a hard foul and kind of pushed off, too. So, Hey, all I know is... I believe in having an enforcer out there. You mess with my guy? What is the the good um, the good fellow's line or untouchable's line? Yeah, uh, you send one of... They send one of yours to the hospital. You send one of theirs to the morgue. Boom! That's the, that's that. I wish my kids would walk in and that'd be the first thing they see when they walk into our house. All right. You know, a lot of people have, like, a cross. I have that. But I think that should be like right after, which yeah. I know goes against everything I learned in the Bible. But yeah. I was going to say, mindset. Says, as, a, as for me, our, we will serve the Lord. But yeah, if you want to, <laughs> you either have that or you send one of yours to the morgue. Or you know. treat your neighbor like, you know, <laughs> love you my neighbor yeah. or send him to the morgue. <laughs> anyway, I didn't have a problem with it. Am I wrong? Nah, nah, it's a I fight. Mean, Things happen. Um, and ESPN had a blunder. I do like the idea of picking on someone your own size, but uh, now, now was, was, let me understand the Cordoza, the big girl. Yeah. When she pushed the little girl, 
Was the little girl, had she pushed Cordoza or did she push somebody else? She pushed somebody else. So Cordoza's getting in. No, no. She's got her teammates back, bro. If somebody touches Billy Lucci, they go down. If they're, if the someone who. If they touch Zane. If someone, all right, if it's, let's say, if it's a, if it's someone Lucci size or bigger. Then yeah, maybe. But it if was it's just someone a push. who's smaller than Lucci, you're like, I'll let Lucci handle it. It was just a push. You gotta set it. You look. Hey, I'll just say this. she was wrong. She's gonna be suspended for the first round. And ESPN said the whole bench was gonna be suspended. Yeah, yeah which is wrong. But, um, but and besides that, would it matter? Because they're both matter. one seed, so yeah. they're gonna be playing sixteen seeds. Uh, Shouldn't matter. Yeah. But but if the, if South Carolina and LSU play another basketball game. I'm going to watch it for the same reason I watch hockey. For the fights. Yeah. So I'm going to read you a couple of the quotes. Hit her. All right. Tell Trevor, me. Tell me Trevor, what, Trevor. You, you decide, OB. You be the voice of public opinion here. Okay. Who, who had the better press conference? Kim Mulkey says, I wish she would have pushed Angel Reese. Don't push a kid. You 6'8". Don't push somebody that little. That was uncalled for. In my opinion, let those two girls that were jawing, let them go at it. She's got a point. Yeah. But by so the way, Angel Reese, say? Angel Reese yeah. walked off. Like when it was all going, at least the video I saw looked like she didn't want any part of the melee. She looked like she didn't want. Well, to maybe be there. she was being mature. She was being smart. Yeah. yeah. And then Don Staley says, um, "You saw what you saw. There were two highly competitive teams trying to win a conference championship, and they didn't handle it well. Our players didn't. Their players didn't. I'll take responsibility for what happened on our side." See, Dawn said all the right things, yeah. but who won the press conference is Mulkey, <laughs> Mulkey wins it. Uh, I mean, as a reporter, I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, that's what I. Um, but yes, the 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 the, the correct re- response is the was what Dawn, Dawn Staley said. said. But the juicy, the sexy response was from uh, was from Mulkey. Yeah, you know. Well, let the other two go at it. There's been a lot of drama with LSU the last couple of years. They won a national championship, props, and then they may win another one. But they were involved. They didn't they go after Caitlin Clark quite a bit last year, and yeah, probably. Yeah, but I mean, hey, but when you're good, I mean, is that is that drama? Any? I mean, I mean, yeah, it's drama. But is, I mean, isn't that what what sports why, has become, well, college sports has come to? And that's I think why more people tune in too. Yeah, I saw like. Joni should have gone after. Had Joni gone after Caitlin Clark, would we? Uh, no, would see, we be offended? Joni's all class. She is. I wish she was class with Caitlin Clark on her team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Caitlin Clark's pretty good. Oh man. Anyway, I uh, I had no problem with Cardozo. In a battle, yeah, you Latinos and Latinas, y'all stick together. Well, is she Latina? Is she part of the team? Uh, he, Brazilian or something? What, or what'd you say she was? Uh, he, he Cardozo? Did. Cardozo? Yeah. Well, I, I didn't say anything. Oh, I, I thought they even said that she was I thought Brazilian. Some, okay. Brazilian counts. They um, fall under the Latino. She's Brazilian. They, they call it, they, that falls under the Latino uh, umbrella, does it not? I, I think it does, even though they don't speak the same language. Yeah, they're Portuguese, but Cor- yeah. Portuguese, Portuguese they're, they're, like a co- they're like cousins. They're like cousins, yeah. 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 It's it like, might not be. It's like you and Russians. It's the same thing. And, uh, yeah. You know, any any white trash, anything that okay. falls under the white trash umbrella, OB. They're, they're family. Line, OB. <laughs> there is no line uh, that I The rest of us right here, OB. Line. Hey, I just, I, I'm very self-aware. <laughs> we're going to hit a break on that one. <laughs> when we come back on Texax Radio, I don't know what we're going to talk about. We'll figure it out. It's Texax. <laughs> Fuck woke. <laughs> um, somebody at the... Uh, at the Angry Elephant said, he goes, hey, I got to tell you, I love the show, but my favorite hour is the go hour.
apparently we were a little late on the mute, people are saying on the YouTube. I hope we didn't say anything ridiculous. Oh, me too. It's X Axe Radio. We're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. Rollo Insurance Studio. Catch me saying something ridiculous. Hey, um, I do want to hear. We're gonna have Schloss here in studio. Looks like in a few minutes, but I do want to hear from Schloss uh, yesterday after the the series. Kate, can you get that that uh, bite queued up? And also, we're gonna follow that up with some news when it comes to the rankings. Kate, do you have that ready? We talk a lot about how things happen for you, not to you, and uh, you know, certainly felt like we had the game in hand when Justin was pitching, and then he got away from us quick. Uh, gave up a lot of free bases and then give credit to Rhode Island. They put some good swings on some balls against some of our better bullpen arms. And, uh, and, and there was, you know, there's a lot of, when, when they hit that three run homer and we're down four, uh, a lot of teams shut it down right there. But I thought we continue to have good at bats. Um, of course they gave us free bases, um, but it was, you know, it's just good. It's a good thing for our team to have to go through something like that. Cause it's certainly going to happen again during the course of the season when you have to battle back or, or play an extra inning game. That's just a coach. And I know baseball is sport, but he's just a coach. He could be everybody. He could be a CEO. Other, everybody in every other sport could take lessons from that guy. Just, man, that's what a coach is. Disciplined, intense, intense, excuse me. Um, there's a standard that must be yeah. met. Hope is not a strategy. We're, we're going to get some Schloss shirts made. Yeah. 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 I'd wear that that's shirt. Coach. I would, I would absolutely wear that shirt. That's, a, not an that's, option. A, that's a damn coach right there. I feel like you have something else you're going to no, say. No, I'm just, Well, that's it. Coach. Well, I want you to respond to this. Angry okay. Elephant News and Social Center, Matthew Dawson. What's the latest with D1 Baseball's ranking, sir? Well, Texas A&M moved up from seven to four, and that leaves six SEC teams in the top 10, eight in the top 25. So at number one, Arkansas, number two, LSU, number three, Oregon State, A&M is at four. And Did, you know what? Did Florida I, have a rough weekend? Florida, they went two and two, but two they two. so they dropped from floor to eight. So okay. that, that's and that's where A&M goes, right? Yeah, and you know, of course, you know, I don't worry too much about. I mean, Florida's still going to be a, a a damn good baseball yeah. team. You know, you don't put too much into baseball until it's conference time, and and I just like that matters, the numbers, but. Like, had they lost yesterday, it wouldn't have been the end of the world. But I like that they're undefeated. Oh, I I'm going to enjoy it. you got to win every game. I want to win every game. And, like, Schloss says, they're not going to. He understands that. You're going to lose some games. But until that, you know, you put that inevitable loss off as long as possible. They have 16 wins, dude. We're not even in conference play yet. Uh, we still got another game tomorrow against – is it tomorrow against Sam? Tomorrow. And let's not forget about that game. Wendy in College Station says, Sam Houston's probably going to be our toughest Tuesday test. They just swept Texas State this weekend. And hey, Sam Texas Houston, State beat somebody that's supposed to be pretty good, too. Yeah, she says that they're good enough to make a regional this year. Locals they, need to fill beat, in Olsen tomorrow. They did beat the Longhorns. And so, I think the Longhorns are going to figure things out this year. I hope they don't, but they probably will. I See, I kind of want them to figure it out. I don't want them to go get a good coach. I'm not saying that David Pierce isn't a good coach, but like... I think he just did. No, I'm fine. No, you, did. you, you didn't. I think you he's didn't. a good coach. You didn't. But I don't want him to get somebody better. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Look, uh, I just like to... Tease the Longhorns because, you know, they're the Longhorns. Uh, I'm not going to root for them. I'm not going to root against them because, quite frankly, they don't matter to me. I like the way you think I root against them. I, just, they, I kick up. When somebody's down, like, I keep kicking. Like, if, if you told me Texas is, uh, hey, they got a big series next week, I'd say, really? Who are they playing? Because I have no idea. Yeah, I don't. I don't but it, I couldn't tell you what It doesn't matter who was. the series is All against. I know is they lost 9-2 to two to A&M. I don't, and, I, and I heard – that they had lost to Texas State because I saw some guys on um, our thread making fun of them about it. Otherwise, I wouldn't even know that. Yeah. I think Vanderbilt beat them too. Well, look, keep winning. Just keep Win winning against Sam action. Houston, and let's go to Gainesville and win that series. Yeah. The way Ryan Prager's pitching, you feel really good about Friday nights. I know Richard Zane does. He should. Yeah. He, I mean, if you – Prager, so, has, he hasn't given up a run. Oh point oh oh, that's like John Blutarski's uh, GPA in Animal House. Uh, I I don't remember which character is that one. Is Bluto. that Belushi? Belushi. Yeah. Your GPA zero point zero zero. So fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, son. Do we have how many strikeouts Prager has top of our head? Do we know? Thirteen, I'm guessing, I'm guessing ten, 50, eight, seven, like forty nine is my guess probably way off but somebody's um, googling faster than we'll, we'll think but but bottom line is he's been phenomenal 
Uh, the way Justin Lampkin looked yesterday, very excited about that. Tanner Jones getting a little bit more leash each start. Um, and, and obviously, Chris Cortez has looked really good on Tuesdays. Um, thank you for the spring sport because, you know, it's it's been kind of difficult most of the year. Of all years, yeah, it has. Of all years, this is an easier offseason to talk football because of the changes and the mm-hmm. expectations, right? I remember thinking in October, November, like, what the heck are we going to talk about in the offseason? You know, because hope is not a strategy, mm-hmm. and we hope they figure it out, but they haven't figured it out. So at least we have the fighting Elkos to be excited about mm-hmm. with, with spring ball coming here. And, you know, both basketball teams still have a, some hope to get into the NCAA yep. tournament, so that's interesting. Uh, and then baseball, softball playing great, you know. So there's tennis there's looking great. Tennis, the, the Dream Weavers, your buddy, the Dream Weaver. Yeah, gotta get him in studio. I, I keep telling him when I see him, I'm like, hey, when are you coming? I need to 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 reach out with him. But look, after having a few really bad weekends in Aggie sports, right? Really, we haven't had a bad weekend since baseball started and softball started, right? There hasn't been a bad weekend, but there's basketball had those couple of weekends or weeks where we just felt two terrible. Two and a half weeks. Right? We've had a couple of really good weekends. Really good weekends. Yeah. It's been fun. I hope it continues. Yep. But now, if you do it next week or this upcoming, they go from, from really good weekends to awesome weekends because they're conference games now. Well, Now it gets really, really fun. Even more fun. Thursday against Ole Miss, right? Thursday against Ole Miss. Six Talking o'clock. basketball, sorry. Six yeah. o'clock. Six o'clock, Thursday against Ole Miss. If you win that one, you play Kentucky at six o'clock on Friday. And if you win those two? You're you, probably going to be. I think you'll be in the tournament. Like, of course, I'm not on a committee, but you should be. If you split, maybe? You're, then you're counting on the, the committee to do you a favor. And if you lose, probably well, done, yeah, right? You're done. Yeah. OB, thank you, sir. You bet. When we come back on Texas Radio, Jim Schlossnagel in studio. We'll chit chat with Jim. Uh, Ronnie will be here as well. 16 or no, Olsen Magic, you name it. We'll talk about it all here on Texas.
All right, it's Texas Ags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Studio, excuse me. Bronny's here with us. Jim Schlossnagel here with us after a great weekend. Uh, 16 and 0, Olsen Magic, all the good stuff that happened over the weekend. Um, one of the things I took away from your presser yesterday was like it was good to go through a little bit of adversity yesterday <laughs> where, you know, you're sweating yeah. in the eighth and ninth inning. <laughs> sweating, yeah, sweating is to, is to say the least. Um, yeah, in hindsight, of course, it's good to go through it, especially when you win. Um, but I do truly believe, I used to not think this way, I'd be pouting, but, uh, you know, things happen for you, not to you. So I think, you know, it's good to face adversity. It's good to have to fight back through. Um, we have a little thing we call catch-up baseball when we're behind from the seventh inning on. It gave us a chance to get in that. And and um, so I was proud of our guys at bats. I mean, when you we had second and third uh, with a shot up and one out to tie the game, right? And uh, he grounded out, which means that kind of took the air out of it. Mm-hmm. He had a runner at third base and two outs. And we were still able to, you know, get that tie and run across. So um, proud of our guys for hanging in there. And, and that's just good. Like, uh, re- it's a good reference point moving forward when we're in those situations again. You really had, they, you played 28 innings of baseball over the course of three days. And Rhode Island only scored in two of those innings. And obviously the eight run frame. And when you go back and you take inventory of that half inning, is, is there some teachable moments in there for you and your, for sure. your staff? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you hear Max talk. I mean, we, we, we've been talking about it, for the free base war. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, we, we gave him free bases. We had an error. We had a 0-2 or two-strike hit batter. Then we walked a guy on four, tip, four pitches, had a catcher's interference. Um, so, yeah, most teams and, – and then look how we won the game. They gave us free bases. And then uh, Braden had a double in there. Teddy had a homer. And then the, the final hit. So – it's free bases, man. There really aren't there really aren't that many games in which you get bloodied to death by somebody swinging the bat. It's you give up the free bases, and so that's why, you know, you and I were talking offset earlier. When you start looking at a travel roster, who's going to throw the most strikes? Because at the end of the day, whether it's you know, nobody cares how hard you throw a ball for. <laughs> it's you get you got you got to throw the ball over the plate, and so. Uh, but yeah, that's that, that's where that came from. We got out of our element from a at least what we have been to this point and didn't throw strikes or you know kick the ball around a little bit um and that's what led and then you get a couple big swings so credit Rhode Island and and that has been so out of character for you guys the free giving up free bases and I think that has started obviously with with coach Max but it started on Friday nights with Ryan Prager and what he did this past weekend I don't know that I've ever seen a starting pitcher well, he start the game with 17 straight strikes, mm-hmm. and then he goes on a, like a strike percentage of over 80%. How many times have you seen that as a head coach? Yeah, not very often. An awful tough act to follow for Tanner Jones. Right. You know, Tanner didn't throw that bad. He just didn't throw, you know, as many strikes as, as Prager did. So, uh, yeah, r- haven't seen that often. I had a pitcher at TCU named Halen Green who was uh, – we actually had to tell him to – he was – his command was so good, we had to practice him throwing the ball a little bit off the plate. Um but Prager, uh, Prager was special, and uh, hopefully he can follow that up this weekend when, we're, when he's going to be matched by you know other good starting pitchers for Florida. Uh, so I went back and looked at the box scores. It looks like 12 times this year uh, you have scored in the first inning. It's 12 of 16 games. Uh, just what does that do for starting pitchers? You know, Ryan's in a zone, but just everybody who's gotten to experience that. Well, I mean, anytime you play from ahead, you know, there's there's statistics out there that say that you know that team that scores first wins X number of games. I don't, I don't, who knows what they are, but I mean, when you got Grahovic, Lavalette, Montgomery shot, and when you have those kind of players leading off uh, games, um, number one, they have a chance to do damage early. And number two, um, we're really excited, especially with Jace. Well, really all three of them, how they're taking their walks. A lot of those are competitive walks. Like Gavin's at bat to start the game yesterday was a super competitive walk it's not like just somebody out there just scattering the ball all over the place so if the only way to score is to get on base and those guys are getting on base and somebody somebody's knocking them in so but it's definitely it definitely helps your confidence uh to play from ahead and um tomorrow night will be the home team but but this all this weekend will be the visiting team which i which i kind of like take the energy of being on the road and take that into offense first tomorrow night uh really good ball club coming in here in a minute Very. before you get Ready to go to Florida? Is is there a is there a battle to, to for this week, or, or is it pretty easy? Like this is like 
look at who you're playing yeah. uh, for, your, for your guys. Yeah, you know, I don't know how many of our new players from different parts of the country know about Sam Houston State and how good they are. Look at the unbelievable weekend they just had. Mm-hmm. To go to Texas State, which I think we have to go to later in the year, nightmare trip. From, um, my form, One of my former players, Stephen Trout, the head coach there, proud of what he's doing. Um, but uh, Sam Houston is rolling. They're, they have a great team. They've always had an outstanding club, no matter who the coach is. Um, and we're going to have to be very disciplined at myself. I'm basically looking at myself in the mirror. We're going to have to be very disciplined on who we use in this game uh, because we have a conference series coming up. So we're going to we're going to some guys that haven't pitched in the tight tight roles uh, are going to have to go out there and pitch uh, because we we have to be ready to go this weekend. Um, we're going to do everything we can to win the game within reason. Uh, and if we can't use all of our pitchers, it can't just always include Evan Oshenbeck. Um, we have to use all of our pitchers to be able to get the good teams out. And Sam Houston's really good, like really good. Well, and, and one of the guys that I thought it was had a really good day yesterday and it was good to see him going offensively is Ali Camarillo. Where are you at with Ali? Um, I think his at-bats have been okay, but, man, he watching him play defense is so much fun. Yeah. Ali's the uh, – Ali's the, you know, he has this conundrum going on in that what makes him good as a hitter is his competitiveness. And what he has to control as a hitter is his competitiveness. Because if he wants to, you can't be a hitter that searches for hits. What you have to do is you have to win pitches. You have to put together a quality at bat. And uh, he's constantly working on things with Mike um, there's also a thing and this, you know, I'm not telling you anything that I haven't said anything to him. He's had success, not at Texas A&M, but you know, hitting 370 or whatever he did at Cal State Nor- Northridge. Some of those things will work here and some of them won't. And so sometimes when a player's had a lot of success, he's not open as open to change as others who maybe have a cleaner slate. And so he and Mike are working on some things. Uh, Ali took two rounds of batting practice the other day, uh, pregame. I've never seen him take. Like he's hitting line drives all over the field. He took he hit one in the game and it got caught. And sometimes a player needs a player needs to see the balls fall in to fully buy in to what you're trying to help him with. And if they don't, they revert. Mm-hmm. Right. Sure. Uh, Luke and Baker used to do that with me at TCU. We we actually tried to get more power out of Luke and Baker at TCU because we felt like there was more in there. Boy, he fought it like crazy because it was easy for easier for him just to do what he was currently mm-hmm. doing. So anyway, I'm getting off topic, but Ollie's doing great. He just needs to he just needs to buy into getting his pitch and 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 not be afraid. I mean, I think he he has way more walks and strikeouts. You know? Oh yeah. And- He's been great, and like I said, like he's not carried that to the dirt at all. No, he's playing great defense, and he's he's a, he's an awesome young man. He's a great teammate, uh, and and that's why he's out there is because of his glove. But I think if he'll just trust, if he'll trust, if he'll trust everybody involved, he can he can put up some good numbers offensively. Talking to Jim Schlossnagel here on Texas Radio. So with a few days before the Florida series, Gavin has had a really nice start to his uh, his college career. How have you think he's a uh, adjusted let's say for the for the game it's great done great done awesome um especially in the leadoff spot uh where normally you know he's got to take some pitches every now and then that he could probably do some damage with uh but he's he's uh he's continually puts together good at bats uh you know he had an error yesterday but he's he also made a great play keeping a ball in the infield uh ball down to you know a ball hit to the line of a corner infielder number one job is to make sure that job's not an extra that ball is not an extra base hit and he knocked it down and kept it in the infield, which we didn't get a double play out of eventually, but we, it leaves it, at least it kept us in the position to get a double play. But he's doing great. He's handling everything well. He's finally healthy. Uh, he's played most of the season hurt, um, and the shot he got in the front of his shoulder on his left shoulder the other day, um, he, then he ended up hitting that home run to the left field. He hasn't even done that in a batting practice in a while. So I think he's healthy um, and uh, look forward to to watching him compete in the SEC. As you start to look ahead to this weekend, how much does it help when you have to make those aforementioned roster decisions that you brought up to have two-way guys like, and, and you know, I know Jet Johnson hasn't pitched yet, but he can, and yeah. obviously Braden can. How much does that help you when you make these decisions? 
Uh, it certainly helps, you know. Um, we need to – I was hoping to get to see Jet pitch in the game yesterday, and then the game went backwards. Maybe tomorrow we'll get to do it. This is just one trip, right. you know. And Travis Chestnut didn't make the first trip of his, you know, of the year last year when we went to Tennessee, and he ended up playing a big role in our team. So, you know, there's there are some there are some hearts that are going to be broken, and they're going to think the world's going to be over uh, when we post it on Thursday. Um, but it's just one trip, and just because you don't make the, not on the first travel list doesn't mean you won't have an impact later in the year. But certainly, you know, the fact that Braden can pitch um, and and Jet can pitch and throw strikes that expands your roster. Uh, that doesn't mean I th- I'm pretty sure Braden's going to be on the on the list, uh, but you know Jet ha- haven't you know he's he's he, Jet's going to be an awesome player for us over time, uh, and he's a good player now. But we it's it's about who's going to help us win this weekend. What are the matchups against the uh, Florida? Well, I think they start two lefties in their rotation, um, so that plays a role in things. Uh, who's healthy? Chestnut goes down right before the game yesterday. That changes the roster. Can Targotch play? We'll find out between now and Thursday. Um, so there's a, a lot that goes into it. But, yes, uh, maximizing the roster is super important. How important are some of these runouts in these games for guys like Lucas Jackson and Weston Moss and, and Zane Badmiev and Isaac Morton? You guys got to get a look at them under the lights because uh, <clears throat> these are really tight decisions. So even tomorrow against Sam Houston State, can, can some of these guys – Will they have the opportunity to kind of pitch their way onto the roster? Of course, yeah. And Wednesday in a sim game. I mean, we just put it to you this way: 2022, we're going to the College World Series, and on the Wednesday before we leave, we're having a simulated game between three pitchers. And it's like whichever one of y'all three pitches the best is getting on the freaking flight to go to the College <laughs> World Series. That's how up in the air it is, and so um, it, that's either a really bad thing or it's a really good thing. Right now, it's a really good thing. And so uh, we've seen Zane come in, uh, Weston, you know, starting to really get an idea of what Josh Stewart can do. Mm-hmm. So he's solidified himself. And so now, all right, when Stewie, we need Stewie for the long haul. So Weston, can you come in here and get us three to six outs? Zane, can you do that? Eldridge, you know, he's never pitched like that in any inter squad right. game in terms of velocity. Um, he threw strikes, not a ton of strikes, but he threw enough strikes to where, okay, now, Hopefully tomorrow night. I mean, tomorrow night we're going to have to pitch some guys that a guy like Armstrong and Badmiev and Moss, um, hopefully not Rudis again, would like not to use Stewart again. But we're going to use a multitude of pitchers tomorrow to try and beat a really good team, and that's their chance to to earn their way on the rosters. I'm watching the game yesterday with my sons, and Evan comes into the game, and Cruz says, Dad, how do we feel about this guy? I was like, I think they're in pretty good hands. They'll be yeah. all right. It's just, you know when he comes on the mound, you, you feel pretty good. Feel really good. I was hoping not to pitch him uh, one inning. He'll be fine. What was funny about the last inning is, uh, you know, I had put um, I Appel came in place. to catch. So I lost my DH or lost our DH. And I looked at Montgomery and there was a bunch of guys around. I said, you guys better score a run. Or we're all going to have to sit here and watch Oshenbeck hit because I wasn't going to take him out, right? So um, I, there was a joke in the dugout as to whether we really wanted to score or would it, would it, <laughs> would it have been fun to watch Oshenbeck hit. So I was going to make him go up there. And Do you, even, do you know who Eddie Goodell is? No. Yeah, Eddie Goodell was uh, in the 20s, uh, uh, the, the, the famous owner of the, I think it was the White Sox, who was, always had all these gimmicks. He he hired a um, I don't know what the politically correct little term person. is a little, little person little person yeah yeah Eddie Goodell go in the batter's box and he drew a walk oh it, it, yeah it was the gimmick and so I was like I told Ashen back I'm gonna make you be Eddie Goodell you're gonna have to squat down <laughs> don't get hit and put on all the armor the <laughs> Evo shield <laughs> he was wanting to swing he's like coach I'm gonna walk him off but <laughs> thankfully Hayden got his hit well to speak to Hayden a little bit because obviously really endeared himself to the fan base because of the kind of human being he is. But I think we're kind of, we're starting to see what I I had some like Jack Moss like comparisons to him in, sure. the, in the fall and then lead up to the spring and we're starting to see that play out a little yep. bit. Yep, very very good. Very astute on your part. Um when he can just take that ball and shoot a ground ball down the third base line or shoot a ball in the sixth hole. He's a different look. He's he's different than Braden. He's different than Jace. Uh very composed. One thing I love about He's got some Dylan Rock in him in that he'll take he'll chase a pitch out of the strike zone, but it won't ruin his entire at bat. 
Mm -hmm. um, he'll get back into the at bat. And so that's experience. And, and uh, we all know what he brings to the clubhouse and brings to the team. And uh, uh, he's moving better in the outfield, made a few nice plays. If Jace will let him catch the ball. <laughs> you know? ball. Jace yeah. caught two yesterday, and I was like, Hayden's going to have words about both of those. He just yeah, ran right and, in front of him. And Ali's <laughs> camped under a ball, yeah. and Jace runs 9,000 feet to come catch it. So <laughs> he's trying to win some glove, glo gold glove award or something. I don't know. Is there a mindset change when it becomes conference play? Or is this, you know, especially the way you all are playing, is it just keep doing what we're doing, guys? I mean, I think everybody knows when you come here to play in the SEC. So everybody knows what that is. And so I think, um, I don't know if there's a mindset change, but they know they know that the level of play is going up. We're still playing the game and all that coachy stuff. Uh, there's definitely a mindset change as a coaching staff because you look at us, um, we threw Cortez out there for a weekend because we're trying to figure out who are our best seven to eight arms that A, throw strikes, but B, also have something on the ball that can do something unique to get out these great hitters um, that are on these teams that we're going to play. And so there is a, to, to answer your question about a mindset change, I don't want our players to change. I just want them to play. But uh, from a coaching staff standpoint, we're trying to figure out who can do what uh, over the course of a weekend. Before we let you go, I got to ask you this. There was photo, and I don't know if you're aware of this, there's photo evidence that has surfaced of Billy Lucci sitting behind the Rhode Island dugout during that eight run, eight run inning. There's some people believe that that's when he showed up and then sat down there. Do, <laughs> do you get, do you think he's worried about your team's popularity and stardom and that you're surpassing him in this town so <laughs> he's trying to undermine you as much as he can? I think, I think uh, he was in full effect in Austin uh, on Tuesday. Um, I know Longhorn fans enjoyed that. Uh, I wonder if Longhorn fans thought he actually existed, but then they finally got to see him. It's like, yeah. oh, and he here's Billy. soaked it up. Didn't no, he? I'm just kidding. Uh, I didn't know he was at the game. Uh, he definitely doesn't like to get up early enough to come in here and talk to me. So, but <laughs> coach Elko comes, uh, I'll be there at seven 45. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. That was awesome. Thanks, hey, man. Schloss, thank you so much. Appreciate yeah, it, man. man. Appreciate all you guys do. You guys yeah. are fun. It's awesome. Gig them. All right. When we come back here on Tech Sacks Radio, a little bit more with Bronny. Uh, Boom Wright going to join us at 935. That and more is Tech Sacks.
Tech Ags Radio presented by David Garner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Uh, Bronny's still here with us. So, yes, as we're watching the game and they're up, was it 7-0? Mm -hmm. And the Twins go do something. They're watching the game with me and they, go, and they come back and now that they're losing and they're like, Dad, what the heck happened? Are we going to lose our first game of the year? I was like, no, nah, I don't think that. I think we'll be all right. Then the eighth inning happens. Is that when they had the bases loaded? Or is that yeah, the they had the solo homer by Teddy and then got the bases loaded with – one out, I think it was. Yeah, because you didn't uh, – Braden and Jace didn't, didn't drive anybody in. Right. Yeah, and then and, shot hit a line drive right at the right fielder. And I was like, uh, we're going to get some runs here. And then we didn't get it. And then I was like, oh, I don't know. You know but yet, you just get a run here, get a run there, finish it off. It was um, – first of all, I want to say this. Much like yourself, everybody inside the ballpark, I'm sure, was going, okay, is this the – this is the first one. We know the first loss is coming. And that was the first adversity that we had seen Texas A&M have really all year, but especially at home. Late, you know? too, yeah. Yeah. And they were entering the final, their final three at-bats facing a deficit for the first time. And not just any deficit. I mean, they were down by four runs. Uh, and the, the crowd at Olsen Field – jumped on the back of the team. Yeah. And that was so cool to see. Nobody, like, got up and left. Everybody stayed. And then they started getting into every pitch. And there were some fantastic at-bats by the Aggies late in that game where they drew some walks. And like Coach Schlossnagel said, competitive walks. But there was also some real pressure being put on the Rhode Island pitching staff by that crowd at Olsen Field at Bluebell Park. I thought they were fantastic. And it was so cool to see because – as you're going through a 14, 15 game winning streak, you just don't know. Like I'm sitting there, and the crowds have been great in terms of people showing up Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The, the place has been packed, but you've not had to see them really amp up and, and get behind this ball club much. And I think when the fans did that yesterday, it kind of showed me at least how invested this fan base is yep. in this Aggie baseball team. Because, like I said, when you're 15-0, and 0, you don't really know. Are people showing up because they're, they're like watching this team play and they're winning, or are they really engaged with this club? And I thought that the fans had almost as much to do with that comeback and rally late uh, as the players themselves yesterday. I thought it was fantastic. What is different about Brad Rudis this year? Well, you know, the changes that he made from a delivery standpoint with Max Wiener were almost necessary. As effective as he was in 2022 as a freshman, and remember, he was one of their most relied upon bullpen arms during that, that run to Omaha, it, it was kind of the opposite last year. And it wasn't, it's never, ever in the, Brad's life been a problem with him throwing the ball over the plate. It's that last year he was throwing it over the plate a lot and it didn't have enough, the ball wasn't doing enough to miss barrels. And I think he had like an, an opposing batting average against over three three ten or three twenty. It was it was probably something that Brad went, man. I don't I don't know if I can keep doing this like that. And, and to his credit, one thousand percent to his credit, he was open to change when Max Weiner got here. And his really like you know I think when people started when you looked at this roster to start the season. Brad Rudis was one of those guys where you're going, I don't know, like, what is Brad going to be? Yeah. And now he's pitched himself into, without question, one of those travel spot rosters that are going to be so highly valuable on this team. But more so than that, he's, he's going to be one of your most relied upon right-handers out of the bullpen in tight spots. And, and that's – I'm so happy for Brad for him to be able to get back to that spot in this team like he was a couple of years ago. Back to that question I asked uh, Schloss, 12 to 16 games they've scored in the first inning, and obviously having an early lead does so much for the mindset of the entire team, not just the pitching staff. But to do it in the first inning, to me, is like, I mean, I don't, I don't feel like I see that. All. I mean, this is a, that's a lot. Isn't that a very high percentage? Well, look at the guys that you're yeah. running to the plate. I mean, legitimately three first-round picks and your first three hitters. And with the way Braden Montgomery's playing, which Jace is awesome, Jace – potential All-American, might end up setting the school home run record here, will be one of the greatest players that's ever played here, without question. What Braden Montgomery's doing right mm -hmm. now is another level. Can you imagine this? So yesterday I think he went two for five in that game, and his average dropped. Right. You know how just insane Stupid. that is? 
Uh, but, yeah, with those three guys manning those top three spots. And then, really, over the last week, starting at that game in Austin against Texas, Hayden Schott has become a he real has. formidable piece of this offense. And that is kind of what I had seen from Hayden throughout the course of the fall and the preseason buildup where I was like, man, this guy just gets a bunch of hits. And it's down the left field line, it's down the right field line, it's up the middle. Uh, you know, he almost hit another homer this weekend to dead to dead center after hitting the one the big one on Wednesday night against Texas Southern. That ball he hit yesterday to win the game came off the bat at 107 miles an hour. Uh and, and then it's just it's longer than that, too, because Teddy Burton is quietly putting himself yep. uh, putting together a really good first part of the season. Jackson Appel is on base all the time. So now we're at six guys deep where not only can they hit, they're on base all the time. And so where this order becomes just otherworldly dangerous is if somebody steps up in that bottom three, like Ali Camarillo is going to play. Right. Like he could hit a buck 40 because of what he does defensively. Like he's, he's going to play. play. Uh, Travis Chestnut being out probably for an extended period of time. I don't know. I don't really have obliques. I think you have obliques. I don't have them. But I've heard that when you pull one, it can be it bothersome. Can, yeah. And especially on a rotational sport like baseball. Like it, Travis could be sidelined for a while here after playing so well and, and being like a spark plug at the bottom of the order. So, I mean, opportunity. And, and Travis did, took his opportunity and did the most with it, which is why – he was getting his name written into that starting lineup. But now it's another huge opportunity for Caden Kent and Jack Bell. Yep. Ryan Targotch getting healthy. Like, there's going to be those seven, eight, nine spots are going to be pretty important. Not that they don't have to get a bunch of hits, they don't have to hit doubles and homers. Can you just keep the line moving? Right. And, and hand the bat to Gavin, Jace, Braden, Hayden, Teddy, Jackson. Like, if those guys at the bottom are going to find a way to get just get to first base often, A&M could put up some big number innings. So you mentioned those names, and I, it caught my attention, so I looked. The top uh, average on the team, Braden Montgomery, 397. Teddy Burton, 375. Hayden Schott, 333. The next one, 333, Jackson Appel. All new players to Texas A&M. Yeah, and doesn't that speak to the job of – the scouting that they do over there. Mm -hmm. so it's Nolan Kane and the scouting and recruiting, but then the development for these guys once they get to campus by Michael Early. And it's something that's – it's a huge part of the recruiting tool. Hey, come to Texas A&M, and what we've shown so far is even though you're playing in the best league in America, your numbers will make you better. And it's happened with Dylan Rock and Troy Clanch and Jack Moss and Hunter Haas. So there's, like, real data – that they take these guys from wherever they're getting them, whether it's a Pac-12 program like Arizona State or Stanford or UTSA, Penn, Columbia, Michigan. It doesn't matter. They come in here and with the preparation and work that they do to get themselves clean their swings up, understand the strike zone, and then compete against – like it's like a culture thing to compete every time they go in the batter's box. Like that brings out the best – in these transfer players. And it's been, it, it has to be a massive feather in the hat of, like I said, Nolan Kane and Michael Early. Thank you, Brownie. Thank you. Appreciate you. Caldwell Country Chevrolet Time, Highway 21 and Caldwell online, caldwellcountrychevrolet.com. When you're looking for that new car, why don't you consider Caldwell Country Chevrolet because of all the things I've been talking about for a long time, the customer service, the pricing, the people, uh, the great deals. Like you, you do that, you're going to be very happy when you go to Caldwell Country Chevrolet. When you make that drive out there, you're going to be greeted by a great uh staff out there that's going to get you in the right vehicle for your situation whatever it may be we needed a tahoe or a bigger vehicle they got us in the tahoe we did the test drive we got the great pricing the great financing and we jumped all over it and i know you'll have the same kind of deal and uh, when you go there just be be prepared to to be wild because of uh, all the great selection that they have out there it is not a far drive either we're talking 15 minutes the very edge of brian to the beginnings of Caldwell, a short conversation away, but you're certainly going to see the difference when you step on the lot and do business with the great people there at Caldwell Country Chevrolet. Highway 21 in Caldwell, online, caldwellcountrychevrolet.com.
Welcome back to Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers, Rollo Insurance Studio, checking in on Boomer White. We'll see if we can get him here in a moment. We'll, uh, we'll try him here. But let's go to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center and check in with Matteo Dawson. Matthew? So today's March 11th, and why is that significant? I'm actually wearing my high school baseball jacket in commemoration of this. March 11th, if you can remember, it was a Friday. It was the day that the NBA canceled the season or suspended the season due to COVID. I remember coming home from baseball practice that day and hearing that news. I had a math test. Well, actually, I guess it was Thursday and then the Friday was the 12th. I remember coming home because I had a math test the next day and I'm like, God, I really don't want to take it. Is so that the day brother, Rudy Gobert coughed on the mics? Yeah, so he had coughed like two days before and touched all the microphones and then like he, uh, then it was like confirmed like a couple days later that he had COVID and the NBA suspended their season and I was like, whoa. Could I not have school tomorrow? This is unbelievable. And then, of course, senior season of baseball gets canceled. School gets canceled. World is in chaos. So I guess I got what I asked for. But yeah. At um, what cost? It's amazing uh, that it's four years. Like, just to me, like, that it doesn't fe- seem like yesterday, but not too far off from yesterday. Yeah, it's crazy what it did to sports, too. Specifically, collegiate sports. I mean, it, it set, I mean, recruiting cycles back. and. You know, especially like in football, you have you didn't get a senior season to evaluate players. You know, so uh, it, it was a very difficult evaluation process, I would imagine, for the scouting teams for individual schools. And then also, you have you're still having uh, Drew Pine just transferred from Arizona State. Right, he's gonna be like in a seventh year of eligibility. So. All right, let's do this. Let's go straight to the hotline. Boomer White's with us to break it all down from this weekend. Boomer, good morning, buddy. How you been? Oh, man, I'm great. Good to hear from you, David. And uh, the, the fun, crazy game yesterday. I enjoyed watching that one. Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about that because it was a weird game in the fact that, like, I thought they were cruising. Then they weren't, obviously. I never really doubted that they were going to win. Maybe in the in heading into the ninth, I was like, well, maybe this is the first time. But, you know, they, they, they delivered what they needed to do. Yeah, I mean, talk about having your backs up against the wall in a situation that you didn't expect an hour prior to that. You know, you get off this 7-0 lead, and you kind of think it's a wrap based off the the first 15 games of the season. And you look up, and uh, you're about to be, I don't know, significantly upset except for that first loss. So I I think that you got you're in a position where you could have mailed it in and said, well, you know, it's going to come some point. You know, we're going to finally, we're finally going to get that loss. And then maybe it's now, and, and you look up, and guys fought their way back uh, for a few innings, uh, chipped away at the lead, and yeah, uh, put some, put together some good at bats, and you got to see our our Aggies uh, bat in the bottom of the ninth the first time at home all year, and um, they they prevailed, and that was good to see. I, I do this. I'm very guilty of saying like, hey, it's you know, it's only the non-conference, but I mean. They're 16 or no. They're doing it multiple ways. Their pitching has been great. Their batting is obviously fan- phenomenal. Uh, relief pitching, like everything has been so nice this year. How much can you read into a non conference with a, a grueling SEC schedule coming? Yeah, that's kind of the tough question, isn't it? I mean, Rob Childress set these schedules so, so that he could crank out a bunch of wins at the beginning of the year, knowing the gauntlet. And I think Jim Schlossnagel's almost done the opposite and always wants to go for those tough non-conference games, maybe to get you ready for it. So it's, it is the, the tall task and uh, getting ready for this, this gauntlet that they're about to go through, especially in Florida. Uh, so I think you can read into it a little bit. You know, I think you guys have gotten a ton of reps that maybe they wouldn't have gotten. You're seeing a lot of different players, a lot of freshmen uh, getting not only just a couple of bats, but we're talking starting games and, and getting, you know, 10, 15 innings of, of work and exposure. So I think you're going to have a lot of depth and a lot of individuals, both in the bullpen uh, and in the lineup you can call on. And I think that's, that's invaluable. And I don't know if many other teams in the country have, have had the uh, amount of players see the field uh, for that significant amount of time that the Aggies have. And I think that's, what's good, really going to benefit them down the road. How about the job that this pitching staff has done and obviously how they've been able to, remake the way we look at them um it's max has been phenomenal for them just to overall your thoughts on how this pitching staff has been reformed well it, it, it's it just seems like they've really kept it simple um you know i, I, th- I think the talent is 
is is better this year. I think the the depth is better, but I think that everything kind of gets uh, put in its place when you pound the strike zone with with a fastball and a breaking ball. And I think that that's what we expected Max to come in and, and provide and, and teach these guys how to do. But I think when you go out there and do it, it just makes it look really simple. And I don't know if the fans can appreciate it as much. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's not always super sexy. But, I mean, you watch Ryan Prager pitch, and it's like it's almost like he just throws two pitches right over the middle every time. It's, it's what you see. Um, but the ability to get ahead in the count, the ability to dominate and just suffocate hitters with strikes allows you to open up your whole arsenal when you have to go get outs. And that's what this team's really done, um, starters, relievers, closers. And uh, I think it just makes it look very simple, even though it's not. Talking to Boomer White here on Texas Radio. Boomer, it's interesting because, like, when I'm talking to my, my family about, you know, the players, and I'm like, you know, Dad, who's the best player? One day I might say it's Jace. One day I might say it's Braden Montgomery. What a luxury to have those two guys in your lineup doing what they do, both defensively, offensively, and just leading the team. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, the first three are just such a treat. They just uh, – how hard it would be to know that you're going to start or come into a game versus, versus this lineup. Um, and then not only the first three or four, uh, all, all the way down to shot, but it's like, you know, pick your poison with the next five hitters. Like Hank Barr doesn't even see the field on a regular basis, and he arguably hit the best all fall for him. And you have countless guys like that. So um, I would say that you're going to have tons of different players and, and, and hitters throughout the season come up in big situations because the depth is, is incredible. But I think you're going to have the tone setters that are arguably the best three or four in America um, to put pressure on offenses. And then you're just going to have a steady rotation of left-handed, right-handed switch hitters, pinch hitters coming through and coming up to the plate in big situations. And you're not going to have to just rely on these four guys, these five guys. They better stay hot or, you know, our offense could be in trouble. That is not the case with this team. So we just talked about how good Jace was last year and how good he's been this year. But if you remember, and I know you do, he struggled getting into SEC play. I think he was batting 220 at the time. Another freshman, highly uh, a lot of accolades, is Gavin Grohovic, and he's batting three twenty two for this team. Yeah, yeah, you, that that start for Jace is slow, and I was, you know, I remember being a little confused with what I was seeing versus what I was told, and and I was put in my place pretty quickly as he heated up throughout the season. But uh, the hype is very similar for Grohovic. Uh, there's no doubt about that, and. He he looks like he's a little more polished, in my opinion, than Jace. You know, coming coming right out of the gate as a freshman. Uh, but it, it, to, to put a freshman in that leadoff spot with all the hype that he has, and have him hit over 300 right now, as he's you know still kind of getting his, his feet wet, um, that's that, that speaks volumes of him. And and I think that I, I wouldn't expect him to move you know outside of this top four all season. And he looks like he's just taking it right in stride, like like a veteran. And, and definitely a future big leaguer. What do you think is key here as uh, they're, they got Sam Houston tomorrow, they got Florida coming up, um, just in their approach, knowing that things, pretty much everything has worked, uh, very little adversity. We saw some yesterday, but w- what do they need to continue doing as the uh, talent heats up that they're going to be playing against? Uh, first and foremost, you got to keep throwing strikes and not trying to do too much, even though the batters and the hitters are getting better. Uh, you got to keep going after hitters and make you know them beat you with your bats and not give them free passes. Uh, I, I think the arms. I know the arms are good enough to to hold hold offense, strong offensive teams at bay. Uh, when you do that, when when the uh, when the pitching staff can do that, and then you just got to be okay getting in slugfest or, or or you know pitching battles and winning games two and three to one, three to two, and know that you're not going to go tag every team for ten runs. But just play your game because the depth is so good. You're going to have matchups. You're going to have players ready to come off the bench if someone's not hot. But you are you have the talent. You have the experience to go win all these games in these series. But that changes if you start walking guys and start kicking the ball around and issuing free passes. The offense then feels pressure. It's a snowball. They press, and, and all of a sudden you kind of get out of a groove. So I, I would say it starts with pitching, getting after offenses, um, just making them beat you with their bats and then just let your offense do the work. And, and that's going to be four to eight runs a game, and that, that should be good. 
lasting for you. Obviously, 16 and 0 is very impressive. We'll see how this season continues. But do you remember what the best start you had of your career, team wise? TCU, A and M. What was the best start? Well, I tell you, the worst start was I went 0 and 6 as a freshman. Uh, we got swept by Ole Miss, and we got swept by Cal State Fullerton when I was at TCU, and that was with Coach Jim Schlossangle. He will remember that. So I know the opposite end uh, of what these guys are going through. And then the year I sat out uh, at Texas A&M, which would have been 2015, I believe they started off 24-0 and or something like that, which was a couple games shy of the school record. So I do remember that pressure kind of building and feeling that anticipation of, of how long can you keep this going. So we're, we're approaching that number. Now you obviously have to do it for a couple of series in conference, which changes everything, especially going to Florida. But, yeah, uh, to answer your question, I, our start was really good in 2016. It wasn't perfect. It was really good. Um, it was almost perfect in 2015, and it was uh, the exact opposite in 2012 uh, when I got whooped up on. So, seen it all, and uh, this is a fun little run there on. Boomer, I appreciate it, man. Thanks so much. Let's do it again and say hi to your dad for me, all right? All right. Sure will. Thanks, David. Later, man. Boomer White there on the hotline. Good stuff. All right, we'll hit a break. We'll come back with around Aggieland, around the SEC as well. Right now, 12 under 12, running out of time, guys. 2024 nominations close on Sunday, March 31st, so you better do it soon, soon, soon. Uh, as a reminder, if you've graduated from A&M in the last 12 years and you're a leader, right, in business or in just service, uh, you need to reach out to the Association of Former Students if you've done it or somebody you know is doing that right now. They want to have you nominate yourself for someone for the 12 under 12. Young Alumni Spotlight. Each year, the association recognizes a dozen Aggies who have graduated in the last dozen years for their business accomplishments, civic or military service, philanthropic efforts, and outstanding representation of A&M's core values of excellence, integrity, leadership, loyalty, respect, and selfless service. Previous year honorees have included business leaders, higher education, architects, petroleum engineers, nonprofit executives, physicians, veterans, and members of those U.S. Armed Forces. Remember, it closes on 20, uh, March 31st, 2024. So visit tx.ag slash 12 under 12 nominations. Again, that is tx.ag slash 12 under 12 nominations. It's the Association of Former Students.
It is Texas Radio. We are presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. It's the Rollo Insurance Studio. Time to do the bestie segment around Aggieland, presented by Normandy State Bank. Normandy State Bank, rock solid banking. Website, normandystatebank.com. K. I I am very close, very, very close to being the perfect weapon. Okay. Uh, yeah, you are. I got my uh, <laughs> handgun 101 class coming up on Saturday. There you go. Integrity training. And uh, yeah, and, and the moment I go through that class, mm-hmm. you can beat somebody up. Too. Well, that's true. Uh, I You've mean, preparing for, for that. You're getting ready in every aspect. You can be ready for someone to come at you. But so don't mess around, people. When I hang out with people like your dad, who's okay. got like six foot three, right? Like he's a big dude. Eh, he's and, six one and a half. Right, I won't well, give him that. I, all right, fine. <laughs> he's gonna he's get six mad six. Okay. That. Watch out, Caller Station, all right? Camila like, Cordozo would tower over him. That's all I'm going to say. Well, if she pushed him, her. he wouldn't fall, though. That's true. But, okay, Flage, who she pushed, is, what, 5'2", maybe? Right. Something don't, like that. That's don't why push the brother somebody. was coming to, yeah, coming was to like, defend her. Yeah, like, that was weird. He jumped on the court. Have you seen the meme of the, the guy jumping the judge's chair? Yeah, 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 That's yeah. what people were comparing it to. Yeah, I thought it was good. funny. Uh, but, yeah, it was a little weird that he, like, jumped, but then didn't do anything. He recognized, so. you know, like, maybe I shouldn't do yeah, this. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't. Yeah, and Angel Reese has been tweeting all this morning about how someone of her status shouldn't be involved in things like that i don't know but someone of her status sure went Cause after. she walked off because she was limping she was like hurt oh, she rolled she, her ankles so she, she made she the right play i mean she shouldn't get involved she's yeah. right i don't know if i need you to be all high and mighty and tweet about yeah, it yeah but yeah she said someone of her status should not be involved my in status like yeah i was like royalty i don't know i'm not a big fan of lsu women's you think basketball. steph curry would have draymond's back if a fight happened uh, i think he would yeah I think, he would. I think so too. She's, I think he'd be mad at him. She but. said she would have their back, but way back. <laughs> Meet me back she here. She was walking to the bench. There was right. a video of her walking off. But um, uh, she she made the right play. She did. She it was the smart play. And Cordoza will also be. She will not be able to play in the first round of the women's tournament. Right. Um. So that will be a big loss because she took care. They're of gonna business. win by thirty. They'll be fine. They will. But hey, she, I mean, A and M was. A and M had their chances, was right? Doing some things. Let's yeah. start off there on Friday. They forced how many turnovers in that game? It was, uh, it was ten in the first, which was absolutely nuts because yeah. they were pretty even. And then the second quarter, they went on to lead, right? Which I don't know how many teams have led against South Carolina this year, but yeah, let's talk about it. Aisha Kulabali scored a career best thirty-two. She was going off, um, but yet more was needed as Texas A&M fell to top-seeded South Carolina, who went on to win the SEC tournaments. Um, the Aggies will now await their fate, hoping for an NCAA tournament bid in Joni Taylor's second season. And currently, they sit as the last four in. That was updated this weekend. I really think they have a shot to be in. I think they may be a play-in game. That's all right. We'll take it. Yep. You're in, you're in. And hopefully, Joni Taylor and the Aggies can win another uh, basketball Just team. Just get in. Hoping to get in. And a men's basketball they kept their hope alive, um, and as they dominated Ole Miss and Oxford, that got embarrassing there for mm-hmm. a second. It was 14-0. I was around the Twitter account, did the little Lane, Lane Kiffin pulse check Checked real fast. Them, yeah. yeah, I was proud of that one. Um, but they finished the regular season 9-9. Nine and nine. Manny Obaski had a game. He finished with a career-high 25 points. Three other Aggies finished in double figures, and they will play Ole Miss again on Thursday in the SEC tournament in Nashville, and hopefully they can – Get a win there, then they if they win, they will play two seeded Kentucky. Maybe that would solidify their spot in the NCAA tournament. As an they, Aggie, we don't know anything, right? Like yeah. because like to me They could make a run in the championship and still be left out like years past. So Maroon Goggles says you win one more, you should get in. But win two more, you're absolutely in. Yeah. But we know what happened in twenty two where they did all that, got to the finals, and like, eh, you know what, not not this year, guys. Yeah, yeah, so who knows what will what will happen. Moving on to some football news, the Ravens signed franchise uh, t- tackle, or defensive tackle, Justin Matabike to a four-year $98 million deal. That includes $75.5 million in total guarantees, signing uh, $53 million when he generational wealth right there crazy congratulations congrats to justin and then as we know baseball and softball both swept their opponents at home this week yeah baseball will have sam houston and then softball is not playing a midweek but they will have another top 25 matchup as they head to starkville on friday yeah it'll be a big one awesome thank you Kay. of course Mm. Hey, Mr. Uh, Dawson at the Matthew at the Matthew Center at the uh, Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Give us one quick SEC note that we need to know. Well, football spring practices have started for several teams. Whoop! 
Whoop. So we got Alabama started their practices. Arkansas started their practice. Auburn, Florida, LSU, and Missouri have all started their spring practices. And A&M not far away. Not far away at all. Awesome. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate you. Kay, great job as always. Thank you. The perfect weapon, Kay Nagley here. <laughs> oh, boy. A, a good Netflix series coming to your TV soon. <laughs> when we come back on Texags Radio, Buzz Williams on Texags with Billy Lucci. That and more. We'll get to that here in about uh, three minutes, 32 seconds. We'll see you in a bit. We're back here on Texas Radio. We're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. We are here in the Rollo Insurance Studio. Let's talk a little basketball. What a great win. Three straight wins for the uh, A&M men's basketball team. They head to the SEC basketball tournament here in Nashville coming up, and they'll be playing on Thursday. Let's go to the hotline. We are joined by Buzz Williams. Buzz, good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. Thank you. 
Hey, so literally five seconds ago, got an email from Brad Marquardt. Manny Obasaki earns his first career SEC weekly honor as the SEC player of the week. What a performance from him this weekend and really these last couple of games. Yeah, anything that comes Mo's way, he's deserving of. Uh, really proud of him and excited for him. Um, how he's handled all of this, uh, not, not the fanfare that comes with playing well, um, how he's handled everything that didn't go his way. Uh, he's handled it with great humility, great character. Uh, he's never complained. He's never uh, blamed anybody, nor have his parents, nor have his mentors. Um, he's been incredibly consistent in who he is uh, since the day he got here and very thankful he's part of our program. Well, Buzz, I uh, I got to give you props because I know you do this every year. You find different formulas that work. You 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 don't just keep doing the same thing. Years back, it was Q. Uh, the way you kind of retinkered the offense last year with Wade doing his thing, and and now with Manny having a a huge role when you needed him most. That's been fun to watch. Well, uh, we're we're thankful um, for what's transpired the last week and a half, and. Just as thankful, to be honest, um, despite what was going on outside of the program, um, very thankful for the group inside the program for how they handled the two and a half weeks where we didn't win. Um, I think I think that speaks as much uh, that we're even in the position as their ability to endure and handle all the things that took place um, during the five games that we lost. And so, uh, not just Mo. Uh, not just four, not just boots, uh, not rock, not Lau. Anybody that's on our bus uh, have great admiration and respect for them. And I think that uh, that we're still in the mix, whatever that means uh, to the outside world in our group. Uh, I think that it shows that we care about one another for the right reasons on and off the floor. And we're excited uh, for an opportunity to keep playing this week. We're talking to Buzz Williams here on Tex Ags Radio. What about the return uh, of, and I say return, but offensively of getting Boots and Wade to get you almost 40 points again? I think it was 38 that they combined for, just to get them back offensively on the on the same page on the same day. Yeah, we, we've been very reliant. I know Boots hasn't played every game, um, but we've been very reliant on those two guys in truth in every part of, our program, uh, not just offensively. Um, they've carried double buckets of responsibilities with water spilling out of both buckets. And, uh, and they've, they've stood up and never tried to dodge the responsibility, but they've embraced uh, not only what is required of them from a production standpoint, but their leadership has been superb, and their leadership was superb throughout the losing and uh it stayed true throughout the winning and uh, happy for those guys um obviously we look a lot better when they make baskets but even when we don't make baskets their their value to who we are and our program is probably a little bit too much to even articulate to be honest with you buzz you guys like most teams most years in, in this league i think you know you coached some here in the Big 12, it was the same way. There are ups and downs. You're losing streaks. There are winning streaks. What, if anything, have y'all done anything differently? And, and I think I know the answer to this, what it's going to be, just in terms of schematically or coaching. It's not just the three-game winning streak. I thought, you know, South Carolina, you guys took them to the final possession. They're, uh, you know, going to be a highly seeded team in this tournament. About the last four games or so after that, the, the four previous – What's been the biggest difference in this team, whether it's anything you guys have done or anything the players are doing? Well, I think the belief that they have in one another and the belief that they have in us has never altered. And I know that's not a stat and it's not a sexy thing to say. I know you understand it because Mm -hmm. of the access you have to other sports and different levels. You, You see it. Um, the ability to hang in there when things aren't going your way. Yeah. Um, that's becoming harder and harder to find. And for our guys to 
stay together, not only with one another, but within the staff and for the staff to stay with them. Nobody's pointing at one another. Um, everybody's still pulling in the same direction. I, I know that that's not quantifiable, and I know that it's not something you can touch, but uh, personally, that's what I think that it is. Um, we're, we, we've ran what we call cover two. I mean, we call it Seattle three, uh, in honor of coach Gus, but, um, our defense has been the same. I do think that we've been better defensively. Yeah. Uh, we've been better defensively because we're guarding the ball. Uh, we're defending without fouling, which has been so important to us over the last week and a half. I, and if you are defending the ball and you're defending without fouling, most of the time it probably means your defense is not in rotation. And if your defense is not in rotation, you have a better probability of finishing the possession with a rebound. And uh, our defensive rebound percentage has been really, really good. And when we can get a stop, um, it, it trends towards we can play with a little bit more tempo in the first six to eight seconds of the possession, not so much on Saturday, but for sure the previous two games, that tempo allowed us to be the first team in the bonus. And uh, we haven't done a great job throughout the year of making free throws, but over the last few games we have. And so I, I think it's all interconnected, to be honest. If we can make free throws, uh, now we have a little bit of front court pressure that allows us to keep the pace of the game the way we want it and shrink the playbook of the opponent. So it's a little bit of uh, our defense helping our offense, but there's a little bit of our offense also helping our defense. And uh, like all good teams, where's the line? There's really not a line. It's all one big line, and they're all connected to one another. Talking to Buzz Williams here on Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. So I'm looking at this note that uh, was – put in our, our, our notes here. It says Anderson and Garcia broke the conference record for rebounds in a season with 180. The uh, previous record was John Beasley back in 66, 178. You know, just, just talk about Conference his... Conference team program, sorry, program, program record. Sorry, program record. Uh, just talk about him as a, as a player growing into that role and how every, I think, the, the different sections of a season, he takes it up another notch. Yeah, um... English is not Andy's first language, but um, he is a sweetheart of a human being. And he could literally write a book on rebounding. And if you ever have conversations with Andy and he trusts you uh, and he feels comfortable talking, if you ever get him talking about rebounding, he's, he's a savant. Um, like it's so it's so in depth that it's almost comical. Uh like he talks to me he talks to me during pregame warm ups and he's talking about the rim and where the opponents are missing shots. And I'm like, Andy, I thought you were warming up. He's like, Coach, I've been watching them. He, he his, his brain is wired differently. I, I mean, you guys know he didn't shoot a ball at Ole Miss. Like he didn't shoot a ball, and he had 13 rebounds. And so uh, we always talk about rebounding in uh, shoot-around meetings, uh, the clips, the numbers, the stats, the how we chart it. We call it rebounding effort. It's too much to explain. And so that was – uh, early, I think we did shoot around meeting at 6:30 Saturday morning, and I mentioned to the group. Obviously, Andy was there. It's probably the first time I've ever said anything statistical to our team in the five years we've been here. I said, Andy, uh, you have 167 rebounds through 17 games. That's 9.2. I said, so today you got to get 13, because if you get 13 that'll put you to 180 and 180 in an 18 game SEC schedule. Uh, not only would you be the leading rebounder, but on your resume, it would say that you averaged 10 rebounds 
in conference play as a junior. And so I normally only have rebounding conversations with Andy because they, they go in a lot of different directions and it's not worthy of the team to hear. But the team did hear that. And so Solo was telling me at the eight-minute mark what the rebounding score was because we keep score, offensive rebounding score, defensive rebounding score. And he was telling me the score, and he wasn't in the game. Huh. And I said, Solo, I didn't hear what you said during the timeout. He said, Coach, it's 47 to 17. This was at the four-minute ATO. And I said, how do you know? And he said, look. Well, come to find out, I was, I'm, I'm a little removed from some of the stuff that's happening on the bench towards the end. They had been keeping up with the score, but they had also been keeping up with Andy's number. But I didn't know that. And so I guess Andy was at 12 for a long time, and I was trying to get some of those heavy-minute guys out. I was putting Wilden in. I was like, Coach, you can't put him in. He's got to get one more. And I was like, Oh, I forgot. Yeah, we got to get we got to get the 180. So, man, he is uh, he's a pleasure to be around. He's a beautiful human being, and as I've said before, I mean, he's he's Dennis Rodman. He's just not from the United States. Talking to Buzz Williams here on Texas Radio. Buzz, how difficult is it to play a team again for the second time? that you just played, you know, as the, yeah. as the back-to-back, especially where everything went your way? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, I, I, I've stayed off of my phone completely the last few weeks, and I've just tried to stay away from all of the things that I can't control. And so uh, there's a couple of guys on my staff that are really, really smart that study a lot of different things. and. So, uh, Friday, uh, before I went to media availability, I happened to hear them talking as I was leaving the office. And uh, they know I've stayed away from it. And I said, hey, can you guys tell me in two sentences what you said? And so they started explaining it. And I was like, oh, goodness, I didn't know that. <laughs> I, I had a feeling that we were going to play Ole Miss uh, based on a few scenarios. So towards the end of the game, one of those guys was standing next to me during the huddle. And when it finished, I said, Hey, is this going to play out the way we talked the way you guys were telling me? And they said, yeah. And so I told the team, uh, in the last two minutes of the game that we were going to play them again. And so I, I don't know. Um, You know, rarely do you play a team three times. Occasionally it happens. But in an imbalanced league such as the SEC, if you're going to play them three times, that means obviously they were your mirror opponent. But sometimes, uh, even if they're your mirror opponent and you play on the third game, the second game wasn't the last regular season game. Yeah. And so – um, I, I, I guess the, the same way I've answered many of your questions during my time here, just, I guess it's telling the truth. Um, our kids understand what's at stake. They understand the opponent. And just to be very transparent, I'm not exactly sure what I would complain about relative to Saturday's game. But I also don't think that that's the Ole Miss team that will show up Thursday night. And so how can we be prepared for strategic things that may change based on what we've learned in our games and what coach has done in his past, wherever he's been, how can we be prepared for that? And then also we understand we need an extended stay potentially in Nashville. And so regardless of who we're playing or what time or what seed and all those things, um, we've worked to achieve to get to this point after all that's transpired and, We still have work to do, and so I think that has to be the prevailing emotion. We still have work to do, and uh, how many nights can we spend in Nashville? And, yes, we've been in the championship game the last two years. Yes, we've done it when we had a single bye. Yes, we've done it when we've had a double bye. That was last year and the year before. What are we going to do this year? And I think that that has to be the prevailing thought. 
Uh, you kind of answered that one right there. I was just going to talk about the last two years, but comfort level has to has to be an advantage for you. I mean, it, you would think it has to be at least they're going to be comfortable in this situation. Just like a couple weeks ago, when they're in that losing streak, it's or a week ago, whenever we were talking, they've been there before. They pulled out of it. Not just this particular team, but individuals on that team had done it the year before that, the year before that. Uh, there's got to be, and, and I know, I know you're likely to downplay it, but you'd certainly rather have them comfortable in this position than not, correct? Well, I think when you have evidence of something, mm-hmm. it, it does help, uh, and it removes some of the anxiousness, maybe, or the nervousness that comes with it. Yeah. Um, so much of where we're at today. Um, we don't know. And so what do we have to do? Don't know. Uh, what can we control? Well, right now we can control today. We can control our attitude. We can control our work. We can control the types of teammates that we are. What do we need to do? Uh, when, well, how many, I'm not sure, but we, we we need to win the next one. Well, when's the next one? I don't know. Who are we playing? Well, what time? No, we just need to win the next one. And yeah. um, I, I think that, to your point, uh, without sounding condescending, we we do have evidence yep. that we've done it before. Um, you know, and then all of the things ratchet up. Hey, Buzz, we were 9-9 nine and nine two years ago, and we didn't play anybody in non-conference and got beat in the championship game, and you had a diatribe, and then last year we went 15-3 and three and made it to the championship game, and then this year we played the top 15 schedule in the country, and what does that matter, and do quad one wins matter, do quad one games matter? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Out, right? uh, but I, I, I know that we play Thursday night. Uh, we know who we play, and um, we can control what we do between now and then, and we need to be a little better on Thursday night than we were Saturday afternoon. And so how do we do that? And let's give all of our focus and all of our energy to trying to be in a position to do that. Yep. Buzz, thanks so much for your time. Good luck. We'll uh, talk to you soon. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Buzz. Yeah, Buzz. that was – Yeah. That... Look, they – it, they played a tough, tough non-conference yeah. schedule. That was in response to kind of what had happened the previous season and probably the previous two seasons. What I have a real issue with right now that I'm seeing from from Aggies, it's not it's not all of them, but it's it's a lot of them. It's a couple in this office, and I've, I've said I think you're dead ass wrong. Conference tournament games do matter we don't have a full grasp of what goes on in that room. As fans, as media members, we just don't. Every once in a while, they'll let you go sit in one of those rooms as a media member. Uh, Maybe that's something Olin could do. But we don't know how far off the bubble, whether we had agreed with it or not, two years ago A&M was. So to play all the way into that conference championship game, we don't know how far off the bubble, you know, A and M was when they just missed out, right. and were maybe the first or second team out. We don't know how far back they had come from after that eight-game losing streak. The same thing can be said for last season when A and M was a seven seed. How bad did that Wofford defeat hurt them? How bad did that non-conference slate hurt them? Where I don't, I'm trying to think to last year. I don't. I could be wrong. Correct me if I am. I don't think they had what would be deemed a, like a true quality win like they do this year with, with the Iowa State and some of the games they played on the road at Ohio State, things like that, even on the road at SMU. I don't think they had anything like that last season. Right. So their non-conference slate was not only bare, but there was a quad four loss in there too. We don't know exactly how much that damaged them. They were a seven seed. Would they have been a, a nine seed had they not gone on that run? We didn't think so, but we were probably wrong. Those games do matter. I do believe they carry a little less. I do believe a lot of that stuff, you know, the mind's kind of set. 
But I do also believe that Texas A&M is one of a group of teams now that people are going, okay, they're contending for a spot in the tournament, one of the last spots. Whether it's the last four or five spots, whatever it is, and there's eight, ten teams contending for it. A&M's one of those teams. So they will be being watched closely, I think, beyond the body of work now. Now it becomes, let's see these guys. Right. They've won three in a row. Can they make it four? Can they make it five? I believe if they, I'm not 100 because you can't be just for what we just said. I'm, ve I'm very, very confident if they win two games and they beat Ole Miss and they beat Kentucky, who's surging right now, and that's going to be in front of a packed big blue nation if they, can, if they can get there. And then if they go and even just so much as, let's say, play Alabama, you look right now, my point, I think if they do that, they're, they're going to be in. What's interesting now is if they beat Ole Miss, right now Lenardi has them as a third team out. Another thing I looked at has them as the first team out. Yep. If they beat Ole Miss and Mississippi State loses to, is it LSU? LSU. Then what happens, first of all, and then who else can they jump along the way? Right. So if they're barely in, after beating Ole Miss, and, and they're ten and eight, and, and they're ten and they'd be ten and they'd be ten and nine in conference nine. Play, in conference games, and then if they lose to Kentucky, and you'll have Ole Mississippi State sitting there at eight and eleven in conference conference games, A and M would be ten and ten, would have beat Mississippi State. I think their net would probably stay ahead of Mississippi State's if, if that all three of those things happen. A and M win, Mississippi State lose, Kentucky beats A and M. I still think A&M would be up there. My question is, if A&M is barely in, would a loss to Kentucky knock A&M out? A highly regarded Kentucky team in front, you know, it's not a road game, but right. you know, there, there's a common sense element when you're watching. If they lose a competitive game to Kentucky, is that loss going to be what knocks? And I know somebody said, well, it's Vandy. It's Vandy. You know, and this is my gripe with A&M fans. Will that knock them out? This crap of we don't deserve to be in the tournament, if you think that, like, jump ahead to bas uh, baseball, that's fine. We're all rooting for Aggie baseball, too. But they deserve to be in if they get in. We all thought, and a lot of people saying they don't deserve to be in, thought they did deserve to be in two years ago. Guess what? They didn't get in. The committee didn't think they deserved to be in. I'll still sit here and say I think they deserve to be in two years ago, but they didn't go. If they get in, they've earned it. And whether that's beating Ole Miss, whether that's beating Ole Miss in Kentucky, whatever that takes, whether it's winning three, if they get in, they, they earn their way it. in. Yep. And, and listen, Nuno, to me, if they get in, they're playing pretty good basketball these last couple weeks. Go, even, even South Carolina. Yep. Look, I don't think they should have lost that game. I would love to have seen them get a stop there on the final possession or, or not make it so easy on them to get down the floor for a layup. But, but they played a, a top 15 team at the time down to the final possession. They've been playing good basketball for two weeks, four games now. They need to carry that into Nashville and win or lose against Kentucky. If they can get by Ole Miss and extend that to six straight games of good basketball, they're going to have a chance. I could see them being left out if they lose to Ole, I mean, if they beat Ole Miss, lose to Kentucky. I could also see them getting in. That would make it very interesting. I'm convinced if they beat Kentucky, they go. And I know you're trying to go to a break. Yeah. Eh, well, I was, gonna, I was actually interject. Oh, go ahead. This is a conversation. You were doing the hand. I didn't. I was because I wanted to make sure that. Yeah, we we were way late. For Thanks a break. for letting me know. It's a conversation. Yeah, it's and a you conversation. You asked Buzz like 60 questions in a row, but go ahead. Hey, this is. Oh. I was just trying to make a point. Okay. Jerry Palm has A and M as the third team out, right? Yeah. Uh, but. I don't see Mississippi. I'm looking at this. But I don't see Mississippi State in there. He doesn't have them in. Yeah, interesting. Lenardi does as as what one of the last four in last four in I believe it four is by, last yeah. four buys or and look people ask me on Twitter why am I comparing A and M's resume to Mississippi State? Mm -hmm. I recognize there's not seven teams that yeah. for sure will get in from the SEC, but if it comes down to seven teams making it and they get in over A and M, I think that we at least have an argument. To, to be had. Well, I think you need to win to have that argument, yeah. at least one. And uh, I'm looking at Indiana State's schedule and results here, and this is where I just go sideways. It's like, I, I, I love the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar guy. It's great. 
what, what in the hell is Indiana State? Like, I, sometimes I wonder what the committee, and again, this is in my mind, like if A&M were to go out there right. and go one and one. If A&M loses to Ole Miss, I don't think they have much of any leg. They don't have a leg to stand on. Um, if they beat Ole Miss, lose to Kentucky, I think you can, if you really started to compare resumes, damn, it, you can say they don't belong in, and that's just that beaten Aggie syndrome. S-H-I. Yeah. That's just that. Like, go and compare. Take your maroon glasses, the foggy ones, off. You don't have to put the clear ones on. Just look at the resumes. If A&M were to go one and one and compare it, take, start picking these teams out. Look, I see Virginia on there. Guess what? Virginia dusted A&M. Okay? You lose a ton of weight in that argument. Right. If Memphis is in the – you lose a ton of weight there. They came into Reed Arena and smoked you. I mean, those, that, that Memphis game at home hurts you. That we don't hurts. talk about it enough. That, they just – I don't know. That was just a bad – day at the office for A&M at Reed, I really thought they could handle that Memphis team. Yeah. At, and, you know, they were playing great at that time. Then they went down. Now they're, they've been up and down as much as anybody. But before we go to break, Nuno, you look at A&M against top projected top four seeds right now. Their record's three and four. They beat Tennessee. They beat Iowa State. They beat Kentucky. They lost to Auburn and Alabama. They lost to U of H, and they lost to Tennessee. They played seven games against top projected top four seeds, and they are three and four in those seven. They've got three wins right now. They've got a win over a one, a two, and a three seed projected. Yep. They've got some. This is not a department we've seen very often when, when we're evaluating an A and M resume. So that is something I do think you need to factor in, and that's why I do think one and one gets them very squarely in the mix. But we'll see. Time will tell. All right, let's hit a break here. We are 10 minutes. Way overdue. Way over break. Miller can reserve time. Farm the Table community, they're in College Station. They got homes. They got trails. They got farms. They got wide open open space. You know they have a mission to build a healthy community? I did know that. Around what? Songbirds. Around nature. Yeah. But they do have songbirds. What other animals do they have, Billy? Uh, I'd presume squirrels. They do have raccoons, those. rabbits, white tail, white tail deer. Yeah. Did you know this? They have the evening yeah, yoga. Any, yeah. Do they have? Have you ever heard of goat yoga? I have heard of that. Yeah. yeah maybe they have that. We, they have all these animals. If not, we can bring the idea to them. Yeah. Did you know you can go kayaking there? I actually did. Yeah. Did you know they have equestrian trails? I've actually been to a graduation party. Oh yeah. Have you ever gone hiking there? No, I haven't. Have you gone biking there? I don't bike. Okay. Well, I think these are all things we're going to do at Millican Reserve very soon. Uh, Tandem biking? On the same bike together. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. Check out the website, millicanreserve.com. That website is millicanreserve.com.
Billy, can I get a ruling on something for the show? Of course. Why do you respond like I that? Like, I like that. That was a uh, pants today. That Thank color. You. It's almost burnt orange. It's salmon. I, it's yeah. salmon. It's salmon it's color. It's salmon. It's salmon. I wouldn't eat salmon that was that color. I'd send it back. Yeah, is that right? Interesting. It's definitely not burnt orange. No, it's not. It's um, so we had a listener, Drundle, on the YouTube page. Drundle? Drundle's his name. Yeah. What is that? Drunk Kendall? Drunk Kendall. Drundle. He, uh, he did not like that I mentioned mm. the UFC results on a Monday. So my question to you is, when it's not the main sport that we cover on this show, when is it acceptable for me to talk about something that happened over the weekend? Is Monday too soon or later? David, it's your show. Our show. Our show. It's your, you're the host. But I want you, your input. I, I think you can talk about that whenever you feel like it. You could open the show with it. I wouldn't recommend opening the show. Doubt, with I would it. lose people. But I mean, you wouldn't lose people because as long as you didn't spend twelve minutes talking about it to open the show, it would just feel weird. Right. It would be like, wait, what's he doing? People take crap too seriously. People get upset about things that don't matter. That really, really don't matter. So if you took a minute, or if you took two minutes to talk about the UFC, and I wasn't that interested in that in that card, by the way, I didn't think it was. I mean, I didn't think there was any way. Oh my God, I'm going to do it. I don't think there's any way O'Malley was going to lose. I was Cheeto. Yep. I wasn't worried about you know any kind of upset there. Um, the fight before was interesting, but Dustin. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, I like watching Poirier, but I just I, I wasn't interested in the whole thing. It has. I, wa- I happened to watch the main event, and I. I was interested in seeing how badly Ngannou got knocked the bleep out. And I love seeing boxers, I mean, KO UFC MMA guys, because I don't know what the hell they, th- I know what they're doing. They're just going for a payday, yeah. but I'm getting tired of that, that whole shtick. Uh, uh, it's just not interesting to me. And I, I, I want more and more of these UFC MMA guys to get knocked out and beaten in boxing. So, <clears throat> So maybe they'll stop doing it, and boxers can fight boxers. But outside of that, whatever. And, and just because of that guy's complaint, he we talked another two to three minutes about it. So we can move back on. Yeah, he he wasn't upset. He was just yeah. like, "Hey, man." But, but I don't care about upset. It doesn't. There's there's plenty to talk about. There's three hours today. You're doing it three hours tomorrow, three hours Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Like it's fifteen hours, man. It's my biggest gripe about this deal that we do. Uh, is the way people will complain about certain things that aren't really that big a deal. Yeah. You know what I'm not going to complain about? What? And I don't need you to, you know. Is it a commercial? It's a commercial time. Okay. But it's somebody that you're friends with. Are you yeah. familiar with Holly from Co- Costa Vida? Of course, yeah. All right, just making sure you knew. Mm-hmm. Um, Costa Vida home run combo there in store. You can get the Jace Lavalette and uh, Ryan Targaj home run Combo entree, uh, entree, excuse me, with sweet pork enchilada smothered in house made queso, mm. rice and beans, large drink, eleven ninety nine. Okay. You can do that when you go in store at uh, the South College Station one. Obviously, if you go to Olson, get your grub on over there because uh, they have a uh, concession stand at the Olson Field third baseline, which uh, the menu includes chili lime chicken and sweet pork burritos. You got sweet pork baja bowls. You got chips. You got queso. You got key lime pie. And uh, when it's cold, like it was uh, a little bit this weekend, you get Mexican hot chocolate out there. You got to go in store for some things. You go there to the concession stand at Olson Field for the rest of it. And either way, you're going to be very, very happy when you go there to Costa Rica, uh, Costa Vida, not Costa Rica. Go to Costa Vida, 4501 Mills Park Circle in College Station. Aggie owned and operated. That is 4501 Mills Park Circle in South College Station. It's Costa Vida.
We're back here on Tex Ags Radio. We're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers Rollo Insurance Studio. Great weekend at uh, Olson. Got a little scary yesterday, Billy, but uh, they they were able. Like I I never really thought they were going to lose. Up I in, did. Well, after the eighth <laughs> inning, I was like, well, maybe not today. Yeah. Well, I actually didn't until yeah until when they got the bases loaded with one out and had good hitters up, and, and all they got out of it was one run to cut it from four to three. Yeah, couple of at bats left. I, you know, you weren't you knew not to give up. I had to think Rhode Island was going to go through pitching, but that uh, those last two guys that came in were pretty good. Yeah, you know, or they they were battling. I mean, they had cojones. I mean, both their last two, especially that one guy that went about three innings. There, the righty, uh, not the sidearm guy, but the other one, the next to last. He he almost got him there. He almost got him to the finish line. He was like he was trying to will him. He's there. pretty good, but. Uh, yeah, just it's wild that during the whole weekend, Rhode Island scored in two innings out That's of it. out of what twenty nine was it twenty eight or twenty nine? Yeah, two of those innings they played in runs and they scored eleven of them in those two. And, and the fact that you know they bring Sadeo in and, and he, he got knocked around yeah. after how well he so it was just one of those one of those days. And look, I I do think this. I don't think it would have been a killer had they lost that game. I was really happy they came back and won. And I do feel like Olsen magic whenever you can get it. And, I, and that's another thing, people. It's not magic when you beat Rhode Island. It's not magic. if you <laughs> Guys, sh- just, just sh- for once, just shut up and stop complaining. It's magic for anybody that was there and watched A&M walk it off. It's magic for Hayden Schott, who got a game-winning base hit. Yep. It's magic for the team that thought, they might lose their first game of the year and won it and ran out there and it's celebrated. It's okay to enjoy the good All times. All we mean by that, all anyone means by that, is A&M walked it off at Olsen Field at Blue Bell Park. That is what we call Olsen magic. Period. It's what it is. We don't have to nitpick it. If they played a team with – if they'd have walked off TSU, we'd have called it that. It is what it is. There's no reason to let that bother you. There's no reason to try to correct – David, me, Olin, Brawny, anybody that you see on the street, any of your friends. Well, it's not really magic when you be. You sound like a damn longhorn when you do that. It's, seriously. My point is no matter who you beat, when you're undefeated and you, and you walk off, it's a big win. Mm-hmm. It's fun. It sends them into the week on a high note. And I think the more of those last at-bat games you can win, there is some payoff against better teams down the road. Look, they have now been behind. They hadn't faced much adversity this year in terms of being behind. Now, they did twice this week. It didn't come from the team in Austin. It didn't come at Dish Falk Field. It came to not Texas, but Texas Southern. It came in the form of Rhode Island. Yep. But now they've been down 3-1 in the seventh or whatever it was. They've been down you know, 11 to seven, had to weather uh, just an absolute barrage and recover and, you know, rebound in the final three innings of a game. These things matter. They do add up. Now, would I have been just crushed had they lost that game? I, I I want them to stay undefeated for as long as they can keep this going. But I'm sure Schloss was like, I need teaching lessons for these guys that they've won games where they haven't, either hit great for a couple games in a row. In, in this instance, it was the pitching. Um, at some point, they're going to taste defeat. We all know that. And when they do, uh, it'd, be, it'd be nice to know how. I think they're going to rebound fine. But hopefully this one was a wake-up call and you didn't have to lose for it to be. the. You know, right. It almost might be the perfect result. You blow a seven nothing lead to into what is an inferior opponent, and I think since the Texas game, they've been able. I'm not saying they're not out there trying, but just it's a different level. I guarantee you, they went into Austin, yeah, dialed in in a different kind of way. Now look, there's individual players that hit the cover off the ball this week, and there's individual pitchers that went out there and were just dealing. You look at really all three starters, you know, but but you played Texas Southern and you played three against Rhode Island. 
There have been four games in a row now where it hasn't been, uh, I don't think, you walk in there with that sense of, you know, just being locked in the way you did Tuesday night, the way you probably were the weekend prior, yeah. and certainly the way you're going to need to be Florida, Mississippi State, and on through this SEC schedule. So hopefully they kind of lock in Tuesday night. Sam Houston's going to come in here good. Yeah, they they're did, good. Didn't they do a number on Texas State yeah. this week? They're always good. They, I don't want to say consistently beat A&M, but it's not a shocker when right. Sam Houston over the years has knocked off A&M on a Tuesday night. So they're going to have to be ready for that one. And I'm sure they'll be throwing pitchers higher up the rung. They ain't trotting Brent Swernerman out there out of, to start out of the bullpen on Tuesday night. Okay, just tip of the cap to Brent. What they're not going to start, they're not going to start a BZ. And they're going to throw as high up as they can. Whereas a and M, I I could give you a list of guys that I think we all know we're not going to see Tuesday night. So this is a chance for some of these pitchers that aren't used as much. Probably, it's a chance for uh, you know these hitters to say, okay, if we have to do it tonight, we will. But we don't get to pick the way our team loses, right, or or the way they win. Uh, But I think yesterday, what the frustrating part was, like the game was over, yeah, and then it wasn't. Which is why it's a good thing yeah. to battle back. But it's like, hard to, it's hard, right? To mentally kind of, I don't care who you are at that age or at any age, our age, like whether it's work, like just to kind of stay locked in all the time. And then all of a sudden, just even like sitting here, it's like the show's over. And like, oh no, David, we got to do another two hours. And then you're like, oh God, what do we talk about? What do, you know, and, right. and that's. That happens in sports. We see it all the time, yeah. whether it's blown leads in basketball. You just don't typically see it that much in baseball. But I think I would say in baseball, it's even harder to recover, regain momentum, and, and yeah. get it back like that. So uh, it's def- it was definitely a learning experience. But all I care about, uh, they're, look, they are undefeated with one game left before conference play. And... I, I haven't changed my stance after watching them this weekend. They're not the perfect team. There are areas they need to improve, particularly base running. But they are a team that looks, when you watch them play, and you look around college baseball, you go, okay, what teams can go to Omaha? Yep. And then you go, what teams can win it? And it's a short group. And I don't know if it's 10, 12. Obviously, if, it, if we say there's 10 teams that can go to Omaha, Obviously, there's going to be two, three others that get in there that are outside that group right now. But, I mean, whatever that group of teams you look at and go, that, that team is built to go to the College World Series. a and M, I, I'm confident in saying they're built to do that. They, yeah. they have what it takes. You know, obviously, baseball and the SEC and the format of a regional and, and a super, you know, anything can happen. But they're one of the handful of teams, maybe it's 10, maybe it's 8, maybe it's 12, that you look at today and you go, they got the makeup. They're they're built to get there. Let's do one final segment when we come back here on Tech Sags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
Welcome back into Texas Radio presented by David Garner's Jewelers. It's time to end the day with Double Dave's color number 12, 979-693-1150. We're going to hook you up with your choice of a dozen pepperoni rolls or a large one-topping pizza from Double Dave's. Serving Aggieland since 1984, they have your favorite pizza and world-famous pepperoni rolls. Reliable in-house delivery, bringing piping hot goodness straight to your door. Just click on DoubleDaves.com and your favorites are on their way. As a reminder, they are not open on Mondays. Billy, we were at the Angry Elephant on Saturday. I had a great time there in Magnolia. Really appreciate Greg and the crew having us yep. out there. Uh, one of the things I asked you about that I think uh, our audience would be interested in is the athletic director search and uh, any tidbits you can provide the audience today on, on how that's trending. I, I think I'd, I'd, I'd be surprised if, if we ended this week without something happening. I think it's, it, we're getting that close. Yeah. We're really close now. And, uh, they conducted a few more, not a few, but I mean, they conducted interviews all the way up through the end of this past week. And I think it's, it's narrowed down. Here's the thing I'll say. They have considered, they have considered inside candidates, multiple. They've considered outside candidates from non-Power 5, mostly Power 5, but a couple of uh, G5s as well. Um, they have turned down names of, of people that would raise eyebrows just because they're just known names. Mm -hmm. uh, they've turned down SEC uh, candidates, uh, and they've, they've considered non-traditional candidates, let's call it. So I'm very happy with just to have followed this. And again, this is as sensitive as it comes. That's mm -hmm. why I'm not, I've been very reluctant to give out names. I've seen false names out there. They never looked at the UCF. AD, I got a text about somebody at like Air Force. They weren't considered. There are a lot of BS rumors being pushed around out there that, you know, they're just see who can take the bait. And it's people trying to get the job. It's people getting bad info, passing it around. Because when it's real quiet, there's more bad info that's out there because people feel the need to put it out there. I think uh, the way they've gone about this, the names they've considered, the names that haven't gotten it and I'll talk a little more about that stuff after the fact but I guess the only thing I'd say is if, if there was a point in time where I would have thought man there's a lot of candidates in the SEC that would probably like this job no. and if I had to guess if I was a betting man I would bet that their ultimate choice comes from outside the SEC no. um, but if I also had to guess I'd also guess Power five, power five outside the That's SEC. My, that would be my my guess. And but nothing's done. No one has taken a job yet. That that's factual. That could change in the next couple of days. Factually, right now, they do not have an AD that's taken a job here. But in the next few days, you I, would I be just surprised. Think, I just get the feeling it's it's drawing to a conclusion. Good. But anything, I mean, look. They could have a, a, a guy or woman that turns it down at the finish line. They could right. have, and then, and then what happens with the, who's queued up for no, but I do think they're in a position that they're going to zero in on a target here in the very, very near future. And then if that one doesn't happen, I think they'll have a second target just like you go to the immediate next call. I think they're getting to that point now. Thank you, Billy. All right. Appreciate you. All right, our thanks to OB earlier today. Schloss came by. He was great. Bronny, uh, Boomer White, and, of course, Buzz Williams. Manny Obasiki, your SEC Player of the Week. Congratulations to Manny for getting that award. Good stuff there. Tomorrow on the program, we should have Shereen Williams with us, Justin Lanham. We'll talk to uh, Tom Hart and, of course, uh, the Pounding the Rock guys. That's going to do it here for Tech Sags Radio on a Monday. We will see you manana.